Good morning, everybody. Morning. How you doing? All right. How are you? Good. Thank you. Did we get you squared away the other day, Miranda? Are you all good now? Are you on track? Yep, I'm all good. Good, great. All right. Oh, they keep popping in. <laughs> I'm gonna give this a minute or two and let the uh, stragglers come in and then we'll get going. Ricardo, Alan. All righty. Starting to look like our typical group. I see John there. How you doing, John? <laughs> You don't have to unmute if you don't want to. Uh, I sent you an email. Did you did you get it? Everything okay? Are you uh, you squared away, or do you need any uh, extra help from me? No, I had some uh, work issues there. I couldn't get out of some shifts last oh. week, so but that's all straightened away now. So, alrighty, um, let's talk afterwards and uh, see if we can. Uh, figure out how to uh, help you with those absences then, if you got time. Okay. Yeah, I know it's tough to battle, uh, to balance the uh, work and school life. It's not easy. I, uh, I understand. To, to be honest, I w thought this was an online class when I signed up for it. You did. Well, it turned out it was. <laughs> <laughs> Some of us were led to believe it was other things. <laughs> oh, you mean without the live sessions, in other words? Yeah, I thought it was just a, a regular online class. Oh, okay. Well, I try to get these lectures in and these live sessions just to smooth over some of the details because there's so many of them in the cinematography class and the technical classes. Um, I think it's good at least to hear it from somebody before you have to read it or look at it on YouTube and, and um, hopefully one of the resources that you're using to absorb all this information will click with you, you know, whether it's these sessions with me or the recorded sessions or just the reading material or whatever. So um, just trying to get it to sink in and give you another skill you can work with. All right, um, I'll go ahead, I guess, and, and get this ball rolling. Um, I'll see if I can uh, speed things up a little bit today. I know I've been taking you guys the full four hours every time. And uh, I do uh, I do apologize for that, for the structure of this uh, session. Um, it's the six week uh, constraint really that is uh, making all of that um, sort of necessary. Today, I want to talk to you about lenses, and it's really kind of a carryover conversation from Monday. Um, I got some, uh, you know, some new stuff to show you and a couple of things I, uh, I was able to dig up from my discussion on Monday that I can uh, at least uh, display for you here uh, and get you thinking about stuff. Um, so I want to uh, let me address something really quick that came up. There was a question about the reading last week or on Monday, <laughs> um, and uh, it came to my uh, realization that the, um, if I open this for you, let me see if I, you know what, I'm gonna go to the other. If I open this PDF, I'll show you, there was a uh, situation where the PDF has different page numbers on it than the actual, then the images on the uh, the page they, they they differ slightly, so when we're talking about um, where is he there he is Dave Elkins, when we're talking about for instance page uh, two twenty one in the reading, it is 
really page, I think 250 um, on the PDF itself. And I'll show you here. So if I wanted you guys to look at page 221, you can see the published page numbers at the top uh, of each PDF page. So I'm gonna go down here to page 221 and show you what happened. So it's um, 250 something. Yeah, here we go. So here's page 221. So focus measurements and follow focusing was the reading, right? But you see how it's, it's saying we're on page 250 in terms of the PDF. So that was where I think the confusion was. So your reading is 221 to 231 and it's based on the actual textbook page numbers, okay? Not the PDF page numbers. I'm not quite sure how they got 29 pages off in accounting for, I think it has to do with all of those pages in the front, the cover and the, the, uh, the dust cover and all of that stuff that they call pages in terms of the PDF file. Uh, but in terms of the actual published textbook, I'm going by the author's page numbers, okay? So I just wanted to clear that up for you because it may occur again in other uh, readings uh, in other PDF documents. Um, just understand that whenever I give you a page number in the uh, reading assignments, it'll be the actual published page number, not the computer generated number from the PDF uh, transcoding, okay? Um, so that was hopefully the only issue we had with that um, in terms of the reading assignment. Um, did anybody have any um, difficulty? Has anybody hit that reading assignment uh, early to see what's up with it? Or are you all kind of waiting for the lecture? I actually just uh, got it before class. So I made sure to just go through and kind of check in on it. It's all, it's all pretty much the same stuff that I've read before about focus pulling the measuring the distance and marking the lens all that so uh -huh. it's, it's, a, it, it's a good you know refresher and, and the the example was pretty nice there's an example in there of like yeah you can focus like everything but sometimes you just can't do it and you got to hand it off to the camera operator it's like the 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 example he gave was like when they were using like a thousand millimeter lens and they were so far from the mark <laughs> that it's like he just couldn't keep up with the focus so it's like you know what you just handle this bob i'm gonna i'm gonna be over here because <laughs> he just couldn't you know he couldn't see what was going on yeah there's um there's not too many situations that i can recall where i i uh, had to defer to the operator um, a really really long lens is a good example of that but what tends to happen is um unless you're pulling something forward like um if you do an iconic shot like the, you know, the car coming down the isolated desert road and you want to pull it in and you're going to do that on a long lens so you can get the mountains and the, and the desert to stack behind the car and can compress on a thousand millimeter lens, then you're pulling it in and you're pulling the focus because it will drift out very quickly on a really long lens. So yeah, that's a situation where you might do something like that. Um, very rarely uh, in other circumstances, though, there were a number of times uh, it, became, it can be routine, I suppose, and I don't think there's really anything wrong with it. But um, when we go into handheld mode, or I should say when I used to be a camera assistant and we would go to handheld mode, um, a lot of times, so the operator's already got the rig on his shoulder and the actors are kind of moving around and they're getting restless. They want to start going through their dialogue. Uh, and I've got to get my marks, right? So there's a couple of different ways um, to, uh, you know, to get your focus marks. And when we go handheld, a lot of times I would use a hard tape like this one here uh, because I can run it out several feet before it wants to fold in half, right? So if I'm standing next to the camera operator, um, I can still extend a tape out. And this one here will hold, right, right now I have it in front of me at six feet, right? So I don't know if you can see, there's the six foot mark. Um, I can hold it out in front of me a good six feet before this tape wants to fold in half. So if I, if I put the, the tape, the six foot mark on my tape, which you can't really see because I'm, if I put this six foot mark next to the mark on the camera. So every professional video camera is going to have a, um, and film camera for that matter, it's going to, it's going to have a, uh, 
what we call a film a film plane uh, witness mark, which we don't have a film plane anymore, but we do have a sensor plane, and that's where the point of focus is actually occurring. The lenses are designed to converge all of those vectors onto the surface of the of the um, of the sensor. So the camera will have a mark, and this one has a witness mark up here, and you're not going to be able to see it from where you're at, but up here next to the handle. Okay, there's a little circle with a slash through it. Okay, and so what I usually have uh, on the other side of the camera is, for instance, on my handle, I have a screw that I can dial up like so, and I can either attach my soft tape to it, because the soft tape will have an open end on it, right? And I can take my soft tape, catch it on that screw, and walk out into the set with my soft tape in hand. And I can walk to each point of focus within the shot and I can just see where it is as far as the distance to the camera, right? Well, that's when you're on a dolly or on a tripod or something like that where I can walk away from the camera and do what I have to do inside of the scope of the shot where the performance is taking place. But in a handheld camera mode situation, uh, a lot of times I don't wanna walk away from the operator because you know, he's got the rig sitting on his shoulder. And if for any reason uh, he gets tired too quickly or, you know, sometimes the director will, will call the operator over to the director's monitor to talk about the framing uh, and what they want to see. And that camera operator will have a tendency to want to just sort of bail out of the camera and go over and talk to the, oper uh, the director. So if I'm not standing with the operator, uh, and the operator doesn't realize that I'm out walking around in the set looking for focus marks, he might let go of the camera over his shoulder and the, and the whole mess will just hit the floor. And that would be a really embarrassing uh, problem for, for everybody because shooting would have to stop because the camera would have to be uh, assessed, see if it's damaged or not, um, probably reloaded, um, you know, or worse, you know, returned to the rental house for a replacement. Um, it would just be a really bad situation. So a lot of times um, if I can't manage the, the, the deal with my hard tape, uh, I'll ask the, the operator, I'll say, give me a Sharpie, right? And so, you know, we might have the stand-ins walk to a particular set of marks on the floor and I'll say, give me a Sharpie for that back mark back there. He'll focus the lens for me and then I'll mark the barrel with my grease pencil. So I know that that's the mark for uh, the the T mark that I indicated. Then I might say, now you know, I asked the the uh, the stand-in maybe to to walk forward onto the final mark, which will be somewhere you know in towards the camera where we have designed maybe a two shot or a you know a raking two or a close up or something, and 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 then I might ask the camera operator for another sharpie there. He'll focus it, I'll mark the barrel. And then what I might do is verify with my hard tape on the close mark if that information concurs, right? Um, and the reason why I can use a hard tape at close range is because most, um, most loose singles, and I'm talking about a two button single, for instance, I'm gonna talk to you about this in a little bit. A two button single would be where I can see that maybe the top button and the second button down on a button down shirt. And we'd call that a loose single. In fact, you see how my my zoom camera has me sort of cropped at the hairline here. And I got the, the second button, uh, actually it's the third button on this shirt because it buttons up real high, but you can see two buttons through the lens and I'm kind of, I have what we call a haircut, right? This would be what we would call a, a standard close up. okay? So this generally happens around six feet from the camera on say a 50 millimeter lens, maybe a 35, it all depends on which format we're shooting. but. Um, so that's within, you know, shot of a hard tape where I can extend this out and I can get a measurement on my own without it folding in half on me. Okay, so that's part of the trade craft of being a focus assistant. It's just having a sense of the space around the camera. Sometimes you have to ask for help uh, and sometimes you're gonna do it with the tools, uh, you know, that you have at your disposal. So um, that's kind of, it's, I still consider it a lens conversation, but it's like part two of the lens conversation. So the first part of the conversation is just having you understand the difference between types of lenses 
And then what the lenses do and why we choose them for particular shots is part of a another concept that kind of dovetails into this discussion, which is about picking and shooting shots for assembly. So shooting for the edit, we call it. Okay, and if you're doing that, um, then you're gonna be very concerned with what lenses are doing what at different times. Um, that's interesting, did I lose about, oh no, okay. <laughs> I thought I lost my, my audience. <laughs> Um, so knowing what lenses are doing is just as important as knowing the difference between them. So th that's what I wanted to kind of talk with you about today. So let me go to uh, the modules really quick. So uh, there's a quick basic discussion. Um, glass is the uh, heading that you're going to see first. And uh, that's what we call lenses in the industry. That's some lingo for you, right? We refer to lenses as glass. Okay, um, and so we talked a little bit about the different designs uh, on Monday, uh, professional design, um, cinema versus photographic, for instance, talked about the quality of the build. Um, I'll talk to you a little bit more about that today, I suppose. Um, but focus control now is, is part of the conversation today, and it's going to hopefully sort of set the stage for another conversation we'll have in another week or so about composition and, and visual design in terms of how we compose shots and, and, and the types of lenses we choose for those shots. So this is kind of a, I don't know if you're getting the idea of this yet, but this whole semester, um, whether it's a six week summer class or a 16 week uh, traditional semester, it's a kind of an ongoing conversation that I build off of with each lecture and give you a little bit more, take you a little bit further afield in terms of all of this information. And then hopefully by, you know, as the semester is, is summing up, you, you get a sense if, if you, you know, in retrospect, you get a sense of what the whole semester conversation was about, okay? So you get a little bit more this week, a little bit more next week and so on. Okay, so professional design of cinema lenses. So I talked to you a little bit about the difference between photo lenses and cinema lenses. Um, and I have, uh, you know, uh, more examples here to talk to you about. Um, it's basically uh, the build quality can vary. Um, the cinema lenses, uh, for instance, are generally rarely, they're rarely manufactured with automation. They're typically hand manufactured and they're manufactured in smaller lots than photographic lenses that can be more automated in the way they're sort of created and put together in the manufacturing facility. Um, there are videos on YouTube that you can look at, for instance, that'll talk to you, that can show you um, lens manufacturing at Sigma, lens manufacturing at Tokina and so forth. Um, and so the difference is going to be a hand fitted lens that has been, you know, adjusted here, filed there, polished here, you know, uh, and, and whatnot, and, and then it fitted and assembled for the mount that it's designed to work on. So um, you end up with a little bit more refined instrument. And because it's handmade, it's going to be, it's going to represent a smaller lot Right, so you have lots or you know total numbers of lenses created in a batch, and um, in in the hand manufacturing process, the lots are always a lot smaller than in the automated process. And uh, to illustrate that point as as best I can in, in this format is to show you two basically um, identical optical patterns, the uh, Tokina 11 to 16 millimeter. Um, and then show you the cinema version and, you know, versus the photographic version. What I got now is a, is a lens hood that's stuck and I can't get it off. <laughs> there we go. Okay. So if I uh, unshare my screen for a minute and just go big for you, um, stop the share. There we go. Okay. Am I taking up the full frame for you guys now? Okay, good. So here is the... Uh, this is the Tokina 11 to 16 uh, wide angle zoom. Okay, it was very popular when it when it first came out from uh, Tokina. 
It was the only uh, zoom lens of its kind. It was created. You'll see it says SD 11 to 16 on it. Okay, so this is a digital generation photographic lens. Okay, so it was designed to cover smaller APS-C size sensors for the sake of all of the popular models that were out at the time, like the Canon 7D um, was new when this lens came out. Um, the Canon 60s, 70s, 80s, the T-series cameras, um, uh, virtually every manufacturer was doing APS-C at the time. And then the full, the full frame, the notion of a 24 by 36 millimeter sensor was only really um, realized in the Canon 5D when this lens came out. Okay, so it was designed uh, to project a smaller image circle. In other words, the light vectors that come out the back side of this are designed to cover the APS-C size sensor, okay, which is something like 24 by 19, I think, um, as opposed to 24 by 36, okay? And it's 11 by 16 millimeters, which in that format has a reproduction factor of, I think it's 1.54, which technically on a Canon 7D makes this lens, if I say 11 times 1.54, a say 17 to what's 16 by 1.54 17 by well oh, that's not right 16 times 1.54 it's going to be about uh 20 22 millimeters something like 24 millimeters so it makes it like let's say in round numbers an 18 to 24 millimeter lens which is not really a lot of, of um, coverage. It's, it's, a, it's a really wide beam angle, but it's for really tight spaces, small sets. Um, and the motion picture folks really took a shine to this. In fact, there's a, there's a lens um, service in uh, Los Angeles in North Hollywood uh, called Duclos, and it was um, founded uh, by um, the current proprietor is Matthew Duclos and his father, uh, I think it was Dave, uh, started Duclos lenses um, in the 80s. And um, so they were a service where they would repair lenses, they would customize lenses, they would restore old lenses um, and basically do maintenance and repair on, on stuff like this um, that the professionals are using out in the field. So. Um, he embraced this lens very, very quickly when it came out, and he actually uh, created, um, he manufactured um, a new barrel design for the lens and actually removed the internal optics and gave it a cinevised, we call it a cinemod, a cinevised modification of this photographic lens and made it a little bit more uh, adaptable to cinema cameras at the time, which were predominantly PL mounted lenses, po positive locking uh, camera systems like Panaflex and Aerie had their own version of the PL mount and so forth. Um, so they took a photographic tool and they, and they basically modified it and repurposed it to work with motion picture cameras. Um, and so there would be some sort of Frankenstein versions of the 11 by 16 photographic out. Well, Tokina realized the popularity of that of this lens and decided to make their own cinema version. And so this is what Tokina came up with. And if you look, you can see that the lenses are, are kind of slightly different. They're both Canon EF uh, lens mount, but if I hold them side by side, you can see there's a slight size difference. They both have the same filter accessory size on the front which is a uh, 77 millimeter filter size, okay? But there's a little bit difference in the physical size and this lens, if you were able to hold these side by side and that's the drawback of this format, uh, you'd realize that the Cinevise version is quite a bit heavier. Uh, and part of the reason for that is the, the photographic lens, if I don't know if you can tell or not, but it's, it has a plastic outer barrel shell so only the internals, the stuff that moves a lot, uh, has um, um, metal parts inside. Although any of the any of the systems that facilitate focusing and, and zooming are 
uh, incorporated with plastic uh, parts in them as well. <clears throat> the cinema version is going to be a precision build that is an all aluminum enclosure. So the barrel uh, exos exoskeleton and all of the moving parts on the inside in terms of the focus system are all metal parts. Uh, they're oiled or they are encapsulated oil. Um, the, uh, um, the sliders and everything that control focus and zoom and f-stop are, are uh, all brass uh, travelers and, and stuff instead of plastic. Uh, these are hand-fitted lenses, okay, with a little bit more precise babysitting in the manufacturing line than the photographic lens is going to have. Also, the photographic lens is electronic, so it's relying on the, uh, on the electronic contacts that the Canon cameras require uh, in the EF mount. Right, so there's no aperture control on the outside of the lens, so that has to be handled through the camera menu system on whatever uh, camera you're using. Uh, and then the cinema cinevised version, you control the uh, the iris or the aperture manually on the actual lens itself. And so the benefit of that is that you don't need any electronics to adjust the size of the aperture inside the actual lens. Let me see if I can show you. There it goes. Okay, you see how I'm controlling the size of the aperture inside the lens. We're going to talk more about this uh, after your uh, midterm quiz. Okay, but that manual control of that function of the lens right there is something that you may not want to have to negotiate through a menu system on a camera. You might want to just walk up to the side of the camera like you can do here on a Rokinon, just walk up to the side of the camera and see what f-stop I have dialed into the lens and see where I've set my focus. As a focus assistant, that's really important because setting the iris on the camera is part of my job, okay? So if I'm the first assistant camera person, my life on set consists of making sure that I, you know, have the conversation with the gaffer and the gaffer lets me know what prevailing f-stop or what shooting stop uh, he's lit the set for so that I can make sure that the lens reflects that on the iris control on the lens. And then when I'm setting all my points of focus, I'm looking at the lens barrel and I might be marking the barrel and making taking my measurements and all of that information is there on the lens. A lot of the menu systems in the cameras, you can only see them through the electronic viewfinder or even if the operator on a black magic has the screen open and is using the screen to operate, that means I have to compete with that individual to see the, see the screen and see what settings have been dialed into the camera. And I may not want to, I may not want to deal with that for the sake of a harmonious working relationship around the camera. The last thing we want are a couple of different adult individuals trying to, you know, jostle and compete for, access to the, the camera menu and the viewfinder and all that stuff. So if the lens has all this manual control on the outside, uh, that a focus puller can limit their relationship with the camera to this section right here and leave the rest of the, you know, the camera to the operator, that means that two people can work around this piece of gear a lot more efficiently because we're not competing for the same space, okay? So the cinema lenses are designed for that kind of working environment. So all of my focus etchings are clearly labeled on here. Manual control of that, manual control of the zoom and the f-stop on the lens. All of the, all of the markings are clear so that I can do my business without having to look through the viewfinder or gain access to the LCD, okay? Um, another thing about cinema lenses that are very interesting is that the focus markings are going to be applied to that barrel with more precision. On the still photographic version, you see that little window right there? That's all the space they've afforded to show you where you're at in terms of your focus uh, on the lens, right? So, and, and for a photographic lens, that window is located at what we would call the top of the barrel, if if you were a, a photographer, 
Uh, the problem is if that information is on the top of the barrel and it's oriented on the camera the way it normally would be, I don't really see that window from the place I'm standing next to the camera. So a cinematic lens has all the information printed all the way around the barrel and the barrel is designed to mount 90 degrees from what a photographic lens would do. So all of the witness marks on a cinema lens are designed for the lens to be oriented this way off the front of the lens, uh, off the front of the camera. And I can see in a line all my information at the side of the camera instead of at the top of the camera. And that's a big, that makes a big difference, okay? If the camera is set at eye height on the tripod, I can't really see the top of the lens barrel. So it's not practical to have all the information I need to see oriented in a place where I can't really get to it very easily, okay? So the cinema lenses are all designed to mount 90 degrees differently than a photographic lens. And then all the information is clearly visible. And even the markings have been extended out probably to a, a wider range. In the case of this, uh, the Tokina 11 to 16, the barrels are both virtually the same size, but this one is a little bit wider barrel diameter than the photographic version. So there are maybe a couple more focus marks on here than the photographic lens has, but they're also bigger and more clearly visible. And I know, for instance, if I put this lens on the camera and I set the focus to seven feet, okay, which is right by the witness mark there at seven feet, okay, um, I know if I run my tape out from the camera, from the focal plane, out seven feet on the tape, I know that, for instance, I could put a focus chart right there and I know that it'll be sharp and that I won't have to readjust focus on the camera, okay? That means that the lenses for cinema lenses have been hand calibrated to make sure that the distances on the barrel are the true distances when you focus that lens on a subject. Okay, and that's super important because if you're a focus puller and you're not looking through the viewfinder, so you don't have that immediate verification of what you've done, uh, and you're using the, the footage scale on the lens as your only guide uh, in terms of setting focus, if those numbers are off in any way, uh, your focus is always gonna be off. So it's imperative that the construction of the cinema lenses are precise. And so with all of those factors to consider, that is one of the reasons why a photographic version of the Tokina 11 to 16 uh, will set you back uh, in this market about 500 bucks. Whereas the Tokina 11 to 16 uh, comes out brand new at uh, just under $2,000, okay? The difference is, you know, hand fitted precision construction versus a little bit more lenient uh, quality control in terms of the photographic version. Um, optically, they're both basically the same because they're using the same elements of glass uh, in both builds. Um, there really hasn't been any notable changes or differences between the cinema version and the photographic version. It was pretty much uh, an impeccable design from the get-go. Uh, so there wasn't much to improve on the cinematic version. Um, it's just the other ergonomic particulars that are going to that are going to vary greatly between the two lenses. Um, does that make sense to you guys? Okay. Um, something else that we talked about on Monday that I, I I wanted to show you up close was the um, the focus gear assemblies. So obviously the eleven to sixteen doesn't have any pitch gears built into it. It's got rubber grip surfaces so you can operate it as a as a camera, uh, as a photo photographer, right? So it's designed to be operated by hand, right? Whereas the Cinevised version has the pitch gears on it. So you can see there's a pitch gear on the, there's a, actually there's a, a rubber grip surface and a pitch gear on this lens. And then the zoom control is just a pitch gear and the iris aperture control is just a pitch gear. Okay, and you can kind of see those. Okay, so we talked about if this is your only option, uh, if the cinema version of this lens is cost prohibitive and this is the lens you wanna to use to shoot your content, 
uh, we talked about how you can adapt this uh, to be used, for instance, with a focus assist. And I talked about pitch gears and I showed you some photos of pitch gears, right? So I found uh, a couple of pitch gears. I pulled them out of the box. So here's that um, Red Rock pitch gear that we I talked about with you guys on Monday, okay? And basically what you do is uh, you unscrew the, the top of this guy and you can open up the, 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 what is that? The circumference of the, of the gear itself and just sort of slip it over whatever lens you're gonna be using. So in this case, uh, this gear is a little small for the Tokina 11 to 16, but you would slide it over the, the focus gear uh, or the rubber grip surface and you would end up with a, an eight millimeter pitch gear on your, uh, on your focus ring which could then marry to the follow focus on your camera and you could use that apparatus to focus this lens. Um, and then I'll, I'll basically all you do is, is uh, tighten the screw back down so the gear doesn't slip off. Um, and that's how you would sort of convert that lens to be used with a focus assist. Um, it's a little clumsy. You can see I'm kind of fiddling with these little parts here just to get this all put back together. Um, and you have this big sort of lug that's in the way at some point when, when the lens is traveling through its range of focus, this lug might run up against the drive gear on your focus assist and foul your, your focus control. Uh, so it can be kind of a problem. Here's the, um, the rubber version. I showed you a photo of uh, on Monday. So it's more flexible and you can control the, the size of the diameter and then lock it down accordingly. So you can make a bigger loop or a smaller one, depending on what you gotta do. So if I was to put this on the little Tokina, I'd probably uh, start with it fairly large, slip it around the lens and then just, you know, draw it down until, until it tightens around the, the focus ring and then just lock it to the right size. So then you got all this extra on here. You can either leave that kind of flapping in the wind or you can trim it off if you're only gonna use this gear on this lens, you could trim the excess off, I suppose. Uh, and that gives you eight, eight millimeter pitch on your focus wheel with the rubber adjustable gear. So, but again, you've got this lug to negotiate, okay? And you got this extra business hanging off the side. So the, the amount of travel that this lens has in manual focus, um, might not be gonna get in the way of your follow focus handle. But in this case, a wide angle lens has a long uh, rotational uh, point of travel, okay, around the barrel, which is more than one rotation of the focus, the focus wheel. If that's the case, then that lug is definitely gonna hit your focus assist. And you're gonna have a limited range that that lens can focus using this focus wheel because that lug will get in the way. So that was when the manufacturer started coming out with these seamless gears. So this one came off my Vericam and it was for my Canon, I had a Canon 20 to, 20 to one uh, uh, ENG zoom on my Vericam. And it had a pretty big barrel diameter, as you can see here, this is almost like 90, 95, 100 millimeters across. Okay, it's pretty big. And it was a split ring design. So you would use this as a, um, a bushing that would go around the, the, the barrel of the, the zoom lens and then this would slide over the top. And then there are little um, set screws at uh, equidistant points on this ring. You can see one there. And this would mount onto the, the lens. And then of course I have a continuous uh, travel of that focus wheel all the way around and there's no lug to negotiate. Um, but I bought this uh, ring from Band Pro which is a professional video service in Los Angeles. Um, I bought this maybe, I don't know, 12 or 13 years ago and paid well over $100 for it. In fact, I think this one was $200, okay, because of its size, all right? These guys here from Red Rock were about $14, $15 a piece. And the, the little rubber adjustable guy that I showed you, this guy here, uh, this one came for free when you bought the focus assist. So you know, <laughs> that was the difference in, in cost associated with that. Um, recently, I think I told somebody about focusgears.com. 
on Monday. Um, there is another company out there making parts uh, called Tilta. And I just got these uh, delivered in the mail yesterday. Okay, I, I, I uh, ordered them from Adorama Camera about, uh, gosh, over a month ago. Um, and they finally came in, they were on back order. And what it is, is it's a, it's a focus assist gear. And it is in the spirit of the Band Pro gear, but it's rubber, right? So it's, it's a seamless, continuous gear, right? No lug to negotiate. And it's rubber, it's soft rubber, so it can be applied to your lens. And what you can do is you can put it on your, your it's an eight millimeter pitch, if you can see there. You can put it on your photographic lens and give your photographic lens a seamless uh, focus gear for your focus assist um, that's soft and it's not gonna tear your hands up. Um, and it'll do basically the same thing that the gears on the Tokina are doing, but these are a little bit sharp. So I think over time they might tear your fingers up, whereas the soft rubber ones won't. So just to show you the application of it, I took my, uh, my Sigma 18 to 35, which is a photographic zoom lens and put one of the Tilta rubber focus gears on it. So you can see the, um, the, the uh, focal length control is a rubber grip ring, right? And the focus was basically the same kind of ring, just slightly bigger. So I had to measure the lens with calipers and it turned out it was, it was gonna require um, a range, a size range of 78 to 82, I think. On the packaging, you can see they give you a, a size range down at the bottom. So you have to measure the lens you wanna put this ring on and then order the appropriate size from Tilta. All right, so this was their larger uh, focus ring and it, it's doing a nice job. It's, you know, I can still manually focus the lens if I need to, um, but it has the eight millimeter pitch uh, gear on it that the follow focus needs so that I can use it on the camera this way, okay? Um, and I can also take it off. I mean, it's not uh, permanently mounted on like my Band Pro ring was on my Canon zoom. It's, uh, it's just rubber, so it peels right off. But because I got it in the precise size, the fits very snug and it goes on and it's in a, it's pretty, pretty firmly uh, set on there. It's not going to, it's not going to fall off and uh, you know, but it's not a permanent modification to this lens. So if I wanted to turn around and sell this lens later, for instance, uh, or if I wanted to go back to just operating this lens with a photographic camera and I wanted to control it by hand, I could just peel that gear right off. No big deal. Put it back in the package and throw it in the drawer until I need it again. And the neat thing about these gears is they only set me back about uh, $2 a piece plus shipping. <laughs> so there's the beauty of the Chinese manufacturing uh, import uh, relationship with the US. A gear that costs you $50 from Focus Gears uh, is only costing $2 from Tilta plus shipping. Now the shipping was actually more than the gear. So the whole all in, I think this was just under six bucks for each each one of these gears, okay? So I had several lenses that I wanted to have those gears available for. Uh, so I just bought a whole bunch of them and they just showed up, uh, they just showed up yesterday. But I think it's a great product and it's at, a, it's at a really good price so that you're not limited now to only using cinema glass when you need focus gears on your lenses, you can adapt them um, without a great deal of difficulty and without a great deal of expense. You don't need any tools. You don't need to bring it to a repair service. Just slip it right on and you're good to go. So I think that's kind of a neat innovation. These are brand new. They've just hit the market. So um, the fact that I got mine um, even, even in a month's time is, is kind of a miracle because uh, the only other option, like I said, out there for a nice tight fitting rubber gear like this is costing upwards of 50 bucks. So I think as soon as people realize the, you know, the, the inexpensive nature of this product, uh, it's going to get very popular very quickly. Um, but these, these are things that you might want to know. You might need to know if you're, if you're going to use, uh, for instance, um, UCF has, uh, couple of sets of Nikon photographic lenses um, that are retrofitted to work on the uh, 
the um, the black magic cameras and the the Canon uh, DSLRs. So in that case, those are all photographic lenses, you know, kind of like the Olympus lens that I showed you guys and almost the same size. Um, but you can get a rubber gear and you can put it on this and then you can sort of cinevise this if you wanted to work with it. Okay, which might make sense with a pocket camera. Um, these these lenses actually even work nicely on the GH series cameras because they're not they're not they're not too big for the camera you see so it kind of becomes ergonomically a very sensible option uh, and then you get the benefit of using vintage glass so that's kind of a nice uh, innovation that's come along uh, in the last uh, well these these nice rubber and and um, uh, um, digitally printed gears are only the technology is only a couple of years old um the red rock stuff has been around for about 15 now um so a little bit different uh different uh use and convenience but uh, either way uh you can do this so precise focus control precise manufacturing uh qualities in the cinema lenses handmade limited batches um, all of these things are contributing to the difference now uh, between photographic lenses and cinema lenses in terms of the marketplace. Um, exceptional optical quality. Okay, when we're talking about a photographic lens like the Tokina 11 to 16, for instance, um, that was a lens that was manufactured to a high degree of specification uh, and quality, okay, uh, as a photographic lens. Um, so therefore, there wasn't a lot of room for improvement when it became a cinema lens. The biggest improvements were cosmetic and they were functional uh, changes to the barrel system in order to cinevise that lens. But in the past, if we wanted to take, for instance, a vintage uh, set of lenses um, or even a really old set of cinema lenses, the advances in manufacturing, um, the introduction of uh, aspherical lens elements to lens construction, the introduction of computers and CNC machining to uh, manufacturing have all contributed to a difference in quality, optically and build quality uh, between modern lenses, photographic and cinema versions versus lenses that were made, you know, several decades ago. Um, so the improvements are also um, indicative of the changes that are happening with the, uh, the modern digital uh, landscape because we can use a fairly broad set of modern um, um, precision produced optics for our digital systems that have a high degree of quality and a high degree of uh, workmanship. But we also have the flexibility of going back and using vintage products and adapting them in a variety of ways to work on our modern digital cameras. So you kind of have the best of all possible worlds right now in terms of the products that are out there and available. And just understand that vintage products are going to have um, looks that you can derive from them that are directly related to maybe the quality of manufacturing or just the advances in manufacturing that were made at the time. So a spherical elements are pieces of glass that are designed to help the lens uh, bend and refract the light coming through it, register the image on your sensor and have it do it in a way where red, blue and green colors that can be separated out through the pieces of glass have to all line up again when they hit the image plane. Uh, if I show you, for instance, in my, um, in my intro here, uh, to my um, to my keynote, um, just on my uh, my outline page, uh, I'm showing you a, a lens element diagram. Okay, this is uh, this is I believe a 50 millimeter uh, Zeiss Biotar design. The original design of the Biotar was um, it was actually not called Biotar at the time it was developed, and it was developed in the late 1800s. Um, it was updated in the 80s, I believe, with aspherical elements, which are the two elements that are closest to the optical center of the lens, the, these two elements right here. And if you've ever seen a photograph or an old movie for that matter, 
when they shoot a close up, you might see um, purple purple fringing around the the outside of the profile of a subject or an object in the frame. Uh, what's happening is when light has to pass through all these different elements of glass, the light rays bend and they want to they want to diverge and they want to diffract and they want to do things that are in essence disassembling the the image in terms of its frequencies of color and layers and all these different optical elements are designed to bring all of that back together so that when the image is is hitting the film plane or the sensor plane which is back here that everything lines back up and you get a crisp clear sharp image right um, the aspherical elements were a modern uh, breakthrough that happened, like I said, in the in uh, I think the early 80s, uh, and they were widely adopted by the early 90s in all lenses to help with that. Uh, it's called apochromatism, where the uh, the primary colors of an image don't line up the same to create one concise, optically precise focused image. They have the, one of the layers is usually off, and it's usually uh, the blue layer. It's slightly off uh, and it competes with the red layer in terms of absorption through the lens and you get a little purple line around your, your subject. Okay. Uh, the early the early Zeiss cinema lenses uh, displayed a lot of uh, apochromatism and so it had to be corrected and when it was corrected it required a technological breakthrough to do it. Uh, but once that happened, you know, all the modern cinema lenses now possess these aspherical elements which are helping create pristine beautiful images that blow up wonderfully on a, on a theatrical screen um, and you can see very clearly when you compare them against vintage lenses the difference in the um, in the focus factor and the we call it registration uh, of the image on the screen so all of these things are kind of happening and then of course we're in the middle of a film to digital transition so everything is in flux everything is sort of changing and evolving over time uh, and we're all kind of trapped in the middle along for the ride. This is the Rokinon series of lenses. Um, this is everything in their Cine DS line from eight millimeter up to 135. And you can see that all of them are designed. You see these little um, dotted lines here? If I can see if I can make this image bigger for you. These dotted lines on the on the image they're showing you where all of the focus gears on the Cine DS line of Rokinon lenses, they all line up in the same place. What do you suppose that facilitates or why do you suppose they wanna do that that way? Anybody have any thoughts on that before I spill the beans and ruin the, ruin the surprise? Okay, so each one of these lenses is a particular point of view. Eight millimeter. Uh, this is uh, this looks like the fourteen. Um, there's a twelve. There's a sixteen. Then there's a twenty, twenty-four, thirty-five, fifty, eighty-five, uh, one hundred macro, and one thirty-five. Okay. There's no zoom lenses in the Rokinon series. They're all one focal length per lens, one point of view per lens, one field of view per lens, and that field of view can't be can't be adjusted or, or it doesn't vary, okay? Like an 11 to 16, you have from 11 millimeters to 16 millimeters where you can essentially change the field of view, making it narrower or wider by adjusting the zoom function on that lens. Well, these are all what we call prime lenses. So they have one focal length only, they don't zoom. Uh, so if you're using prime lenses on your movie and you got a box of these to work with, uh, if the 14 or the say the 20 millimeter is too wide for the shot you want to you want to get, you have to change to a 35 or maybe a 50. Uh, when you do that, you got to pull one lens off and you got to replace it with a different lens. Well, when you do that, it might affect your follow focus. Uh, if you go with a set of lenses that aren't matched by brand or matched by uh, other tolerances, these are all these Rokin on lenses. The focus gear is in the same place. So if you take a 20 millimeter lens off and put a 50 millimeter lens on, you don't have to fiddle with where this is located on the rods, right? So this, this thing can move along the rods like so to accommodate different types of lenses. 
right? And then you want to make sure that the focus gears line up so that when you tighten everything down, everything works the way it's supposed to work. Well, uh, before the manufacturers figured out, and, and this was via feedback from the field, people using the equipment, before they figured out what was going on here, the lenses might not have had the focus pitch gears in the same place. So you ended up having, not only were you changing a lens, but now you were readjusting and reattaching your follow focus, which is an added step, which is taking time away from the process of actually shooting. And so if you add up all those moments of wasted time throughout the course of a day, you end up with a significant amount of time lost uh, because of uh, equipment function. Okay, so they ended up putting the focus gear in the same place. So when you swing a lens, we call it, right? All you've got to do is basically pull the focus wheel off of the lens. And there's two ways to, um, to attach the focus wheel. So you've got you've got one locking wheel that locks the device onto the rods. And then you've got another wheel on the bottom, which allows the, the gear to be pulled away from the lens barrel and then reapplied to the lens barrel. So instead of having to undo both and slide this up and down the rod system, you just got to open, I call it open the trap. All right. So that the gear is no longer touching the lens. Then you can pull the lens off the, the camera flange put the new lens on and then all you got to do is you know close the focus wheel back up against the barrel lock the bottom lever down and you're lined up right away to go okay and it's it's just one kind of thing you're doing now just changing the lens out okay so having all of those focus gears in the same place made a lot of sense well that was a redesigned concept they had to incorporate into their new line of DS the very first line of Rokinon was not DS um, and so you may or may not have had your focus gears lining up on the barrels, but when they, when they went to the Cine DS uh, upgrade, uh, this is one of the changes that they made right away. They made sure all the gears for focus and f-stop down here all lined up from each lens to each lens. Okay, and then DS stands for double-sided, meaning uh, on the Rokinon series of lenses and I don't know, you know, you can't really see it back there, but here's, um, where's my 50? Here's my 50. I think this is DS. So on a 50 millimeter Rokinon, um, you got your witness mark here, right? And all of your information is designed to line up with that witness mark, right? Right here. Well, if for some reason, as a camera assistant, if for some reason you're in the way of the shot or maybe the actor needs to stand here for an eye line for whoever's on camera and you can't be here anymore, a lot of times the operator will say, why don't you go ahead and work the dumb side of the camera? Well, the dumb side of the camera in the old days on a film camera, the only thing on this side of the camera was the motor that turned the film through the movement and through the magazine but there was no information over here. The readouts were all on the other side of the camera. So the footage readout, uh, the shutter angle readout, all of that information on the little LCD on the other side of the camera. And on this side of the lenses, you'll see this is a non Cine DS 35 millimeter Rokinon. This is one of the original 35 millimeter Rokinons. There's no information on this side of the barrel, okay? So if I had to work this side of the lens, I don't know where I'm at. I don't have any focus marks. I don't have a witness mark. I got nothing on this side, right? If I swing the, the um, follow focus around, you know, at least I have the white uh, ring on the follow focus. I can use my dry erase and I can recreate an infinity mark and I can recreate specific footage marks on here with black uh, wipe away grease pencil, right? At least I can do that. But in terms of the lens itself, there's nothing on there. So what if I can't attach my focus assist for some reason? Let's say I've got the camera all stripped down to work in a handheld mode or whatever, um, steady cam mode maybe. Now I got nothing to help me manipulate this lens, right? I'm guessing at everything. So the Cine DS lenses gave us a witness mark on both sides of the lens. So the, the A side of the lens has your witness mark and all your readings. And then the dumb side has another witness mark. 
and you have more f-stop markings. And as you adjust the lens, you see on the outside of the focus barrel, the distance marks line up for this witness on the dumb side of the lens. So whichever way you're looking at this lens, you have focus markings, f-stop markings, and a witness mark on both sides of the barrel. So that was the DS, double-sided cinema lens. Okay, so that was the the other upgrade that they made when they went from uh, when they went to the DS series of lenses in Rokinon. All right, the photographic lens, like I said before, has only one information window, and it's on the top of the lens. So <laughs> whether you're on the A side or the B side or we also used to call this the LA side and the New York side, all right? No matter which side of the camera you were working, uh, you didn't have any witness marks because they're all on top and you can't see them, all right? That was one of the principal reasons why the focus wheels were uh, designed for the with these white marking wheels on the outside so that you could put little reference marks on here to help you with your focus challenge uh, when you were working with a lens that wasn't ergonomically cooperating <laughs> with you for whatever reason. Um, so these are other innovations that are incorporated into the cinema lenses versus the photographic lenses. Um, we called this LA and New York because in LA, everybody was using Panavision systems to shoot movies, right? The airy cameras are out there, but they're not as popular on movies. Um, and fewer, the rental houses have fewer of them than the Panavision models, uh, which are prolific out in Los Angeles. So the Panavision cameras, the film cameras are all designed to be worked from this side, the side opposite of the motor, okay? So the first AC and the operator are on the same side of the camera, okay? Uh, if you're working with Airy systems, Airy systems were designed to go either way because the Germans knew really early on that there might be a situation where you couldn't be on this side of the camera and you needed to be over here. And when you need to be over here, you need to be able to control the camera from the dumb side, right? So there was more airy systems available out of New York than there were Panavision systems available in New York. So the camera assistants that grew up in the early days of film in New York were used to using airy products and the airy products, you could work it from the dumb side with no problem. So we called it New York and LA, okay? Um, that's just some trivia for you that, uh, you know, probably most people nowadays have never even heard of that before or know the reason why. Uh, we called it dumb side because it was on the side with the motor and no information on the equipment if it was Panaflex. And the smart side was the side with all the witness marks, Los Angeles side, New York side. There's also, a, there's also a hardcore competition between filmmakers from New York and filmmakers from LA. So I think it gave everybody in LA a real, a real laugh to be able to call the New York side of the camera the dumb side, right? So that's just a part of the silly competition I think that we <laughs> worried ourselves with, you know, along with all the other stuff we had to think about when we were doing our job. <laughs> but anyway, um, so think about the ergonomics of the lens that you're going to use. Um, if you choose something vintage because of the look that it generates, just remember, you know, the photographic lenses were designed for, for a certain kind of use, right? And I talked about this on Monday, a camera that was operated by one person looking through a viewfinder, focusing by eye and manipulating the lens manually by hand like so. Okay. Cinema cameras are far different in the way they present and the way you work around them. There's at least two, if not three people hovering around the cinema camera at all times in a motion picture format, right? Camera operator, focus puller, second AC. And then we're gonna crowd a fourth person in there, the loader, when the camera needs to reload. So there could be, you know, and then the DP is hovering, kind of overseeing the whole thing. So there's as many as five people. Now the director walks up to talk about framing. Now there's six people around the camera, okay? So the cinema cameras are designed to function in that system, in that environment, right? And so there are things that the cinema cameras are designed to do that the photographic camera doesn't do. In this uh, image right here, we're looking at uh, a camera assistant who has a monitor 
So a large external monitor on the Ursa Mini uh, 4.6K Pro, right? There's a flip out monitor on the camera. The operator has an EVF to work with to put their eye right to the piece and look and see the image through there. But now the focus puller also has a screen that can be mounted on the on the exterior of the camera. So not only are they using the original trade craft of tape or you know, hard tape or soft tape and taking physical measurements by walking out into the set, but if there's no time for that, or if they want some added confirmation, now they have an external monitor they're looking at and they're verifying the focus on the external monitor. To which my response is always don't rely on the external monitor if you're a focus puller because we did things without external monitors for generations before uh, the electronic cameras came out and none of us, uh, myself included as a focus puller, had the option or the convenience of an external monitor. So you have to know how to focus the camera and work in that environment without having visual confirmation of what you're doing. And the only confirmations you have are the, you know, the markings on the lens, the markings on your tape, right? Uh, your awareness of the situation on set. Where is the actor? You got to pay attention. Does the actor start at the desk, move to the sofa, and then move forward to talk to somebody by the dining room table? What's the order that they're moving in? What are the distances of each of those? And then you kind of, it's kind of a choreography at that point, how you change from one focus distance to the next to the next and follow that character through the shot to all their points of dialogue or performance or interactivity with other characters. And you're basically focusing the lens here as they move through the shot, right? And you'll do that for each character that is being covered in your movie. So you might do close-up coverage of actor A moving from uh, you know, the sofa to the dining room table and back again, character B, who's talking to them in a two shot for their single, they're going from the doorway to the sofa to the dining room table. And each time you're focusing those characters through the shot. Okay, so this is the job of the first AC uh, once production starts, that's their principal role. They're standing by the camera and managing all of that. Talking to the lighting crew, what's the what's the f-stop coming from this key light so that we can get a proper exposure and make sure you dial that into the camera before you start recording, right? Otherwise, your exposures are going to be off. They're going to be too bright or too dark, depending on whether or not you set the lens correctly. So these are the responsibilities of our of our first AC. Glass, I think I just covered that. So this is from Monday, right? The the manual focus grip, and then the, the gears, the eight point pitch gears. Um, focusing with cinema lenses, focus throw and breathing. Okay, so that's the next thing we can talk about. So I, I mentioned it a little bit on Monday, um, the uh, focus throw of a lens and throwing focus, two different things, but it sounds like the same phrasing, right? So if I take my Roken on 50 millimeter again, and if I show you, uh, let's see here. This is pretty good, but let's say for instance, so here's the lens set at 10 feet, right? And then if I have to come into three and a half or five feet, we get a range of travel on the barrel that's maybe a little over an inch, maybe an inch and a quarter, inch and a half, right? That's the amount of turn, that's the rate of turn between a minimum focusing point of three and a half feet and a maximum distance the character might move away from the camera of about 10 feet, right? So we have that rate of travel right there on the 50 millimeter cinema Rokinon. Um, on the Olympus, for instance, if I take the little Olympus uh, photographic lens, if I show you, Now this has a different rate of, of, of movement all together. Here's about 10 feet on the Olympus and three feet is way down here, three and a half feet, way down here. 
different amount of travel on the barrel. This is a long focus throw for a photographic lens. This is kind of unusual, okay? If I look at how much range we have on the Tokina 11 to 16, it's gonna be negligible as far as uh, the difference between 10 feet and this doesn't even go to 10 feet on the focus barrel. It's the last notable distance is seven and then it goes to an infinity focus situation, meaning everything beyond say eight feet is gonna be look like it's in sharp focus no matter what, all the way out to infinity. Uh, that's called hyperfocal distance, okay? But here's three feet, here's seven feet. That rate of travel right there is maybe three quarters of an inch right between those two extremes so three and a half to ten feet is about the same it's about three quarters of an inch rate of travel right so the the focus control on the photographic lenses is very short because if you're a single operator focusing quickly on action happening in front of you like news gathering or sports right you want to be able to snap in and out of focus very quickly to catch action as it occurs if you got to wind that lens a bunch of times to get from one extreme to the other it's going to defeat the purpose of, of somebody recording, you know, photographs or video for um, for documentative purposes. Uh, but the cinema act of focusing, we want it to be a little bit more deliberate and a little bit more pro protracted in terms of the time it takes for the focus to come in and out because it adds dramatic tension to see the image focus and become clear from a blur. You've seen this many times in, in movies, I'm sure um, specific moments don't come particularly to mind, but there's always gonna be a situation where the image is gonna start blurry on the screen and come into sharp focus. And that's designed to elicit a certain emotional response from the audience. Um, the rate of change between uh, characters moving and, and when we catch them with a the focus, like I talked about the character moving around the room and you're following them from one point to the next, right? Um, that has a different cadence to it. Um, shifting focus from the foreground to a character in the background, like I mentioned the James Bond shot on Monday, uh, from the cocktail glass on the, t on the bar to James as he enters the room and back again, showing the recognition, the character's recognition of the drink on the counter and back to the character so we could see the performance of, oh God, I need a drink, right? Those are all moments that we want to control in terms of timing and, and, and uh, temporal, temporal flow, we call it. Um, and we can use the focus as a, as a mechanism or a means to control that, that emotional tone, okay? Uh, cinema lenses are designed for that rate of control. Um, I've hit a lot of these points already, so... I want to stay on the idea of the camera assistant, the focus puller, uh, and really drive home what that point is. Because in your assignment for this week, uh, one of the things I'm going to ask you to do is to demonstrate um, a focus pulling technique by shifting focus while the camera is rolling from an object in the foreground to an object in the background and back again. Okay. So the focus puller or the first AC is controlling that aspect of the film. You can see uh, that this person is working on the New York side of the red camera, right? And there's a reason for that. It looks, there's somebody standing over here. I'm not sure who that individual is. Probably another actor. When we're shooting her close up in this shot, we're shooting this actor's close up, looks like. And so this person is engaged in dialogue with this actor, but they're off camera for their piece of coverage. So they put the actor right up next to the map box to get as close to the eye line as possible so that when we shoot the girl, it looks like she's talking to the guy. She's talking right past the camera to the guy standing right next to the lens, right? And it gives us that immersive sense of being in the scene with the actors if we can capture their images along their look lines, okay? And this is, this is really important for cinematic coverage, right? Uh, one of the things that I see a lot in student films uh, are these wide angles of everything and they might get a wide angle looking this way and a wide angle looking that way but we are outside of the context of that performance so we're in a in an objective point of view where we don't really feel like we're part of that situation 
if you want to feel if you want your audience to feel like they are in the scene with the other characters then you've got to get all of the angles and coverage as close to the characters look lines as possible so that it appears like you're part of that conversation does that make sense I get into this more in cinematography too, because we cover uh, the topic of film coverage specifically. In this class, all I really want you to understand is that we're trying to create an immersive process. We're gonna use lenses and their perspectives to capture images in various sizes. And the closer you can get a character looking to the lens without actually looking into the lens, because then they're addressing the audience directly Okay, but as long as their looks are very close to the lens, so we can get an immersive feeling uh, from the shots we're taking, then we're, uh, we're, we have a good head start. Okay. Okay, all of this is on the shoulders of the first AC. Seems like uh, a pretty important job when you get down to it. It's a lot to worry about. There's a lot to pay attention to. You can't, uh, you have to be focused and engaged in all of these moments on set. It's as a first AC, it's very, very hard for you to turn your attention away from what's happening in front of the camera to address any other problems or situations on the set. You, you really are dialed into what's happening with the camera and who's in front of it, right? So that starts to give you a sense of the importance of the second AC, doesn't it? Because now the second AC has sort of the responsibility for dealing with anything that's coming up relevant to the camera department, whether it's moving gear out of a shot or helping the loader keep track of when the camera needs to be reloaded or answering questions from the, op from the production office about inventories and do we need to order film for next week or not? Do we have enough? whatever it is, uh, the, first, the first AC can stay focused, if you will, on their job. And the second AC becomes now the uh, clerical leader of that department in terms of accountability and, and, and dealing with the concerns of, of gear and the movement of gear and the use of gear on set. And so everybody has to raise the level of their game, right? So now the loader is worried about things the second AC is worried about and the second AC is worried about things the first AC would be worried about if they didn't have so much focusing responsibility to deal with. So you can kind of see how everybody falls in line and, and works as a, a well-oiled team uh, or machine uh, when we're on set. I'm talking about this stuff out of sequence. So I've already talked to you about the, the uh, focus marks on the photographic lens, but here's a closer image of it. So you can sort of see what's happening inside uh, the window here on top of this is a Canon 24 to 105. I showed you these pictures on Monday. This is the drive gear on a follow focus. This is uh, a way in which you can transfer your marks from the barrel of the lens to the white uh, marking ring on the uh, follow focus unit. And then you saw these pictures of the gears before Okay, so that brings me to another concept which is different with cinema lenses than with photographic lenses. So if I go back to my, keep picking on my Tokina 11 to 16 because it's convenient, but um, actually no, this one has hard stops. Let me find one that does not, well the Sigma doesn't. Okay, so you see that I have focus information in the little window on the Sigma and as I turn that barrel it goes from minimum focus to infinity, right? Well, the ring can continue to move even though the focus scale is no longer moving. The ring can still move, right? There's no what we call focus stop. If I go to minimum, it hits minimum in the window, but the ring keeps going, right? That's because photographic lenses, especially lenses designed to work with Canon EF, or Nikon uh, AF, right, autofocus or electronic focus, they have no clutch in here that stops when you reach the extreme, either minimum or, or infinity on the lens, so that the camera won't hit a hard stop on the lens and have the motor, the camera keeps sending demand information to the lens to keep rotating, and it can't rotate anymore because it hit the infinity focus stop and you end up burning out the uh, focus motor inside the lens itself. 
And I never thought that was possible until I did it on my Canon 50 millimeter. You can burn out the motor inside your lens and then you have to send it back to the manufacturer to have the new motor replaced. Okay. So they, they didn't put hard focus stops in the autofocus lenses so that the motors and stuff wouldn't get burned out or over torqued by a demanding camera that doesn't realize the lens has already reached infinity or minimum focus. That's something that a manual lens does not have because on a manual lens, we're paying a little bit more closer attention. And when we hit minimum, everything stops. You see that? Can't go any further. That's called a hard stop, right? Minimum and maximum, here's infinity, right? It doesn't go any further. So you couldn't put this on an autofocusing camera body and expect there not to be problems with the focus motor when this thing hits minimum or infinity. Okay, hard stops are only for manual operation. It gives us a sense of when the lens has gone through the entire range or field of focus from minimum to maximum. Okay, and we can either know that information by feel, right? If I'm not even looking at the lens, I know that I hit the extreme when I feel it hit the focus stop, right? Or, uh, you know, if you're working remotely with a remote follow focus, once it hits the, the focus stop, uh, the lens is, is, is where it needs to, needs to be at infinity or minimum focus. Okay, but we want to know that through physical confirmation on the lens. If you're using a Canon photographic lens on a digital cinema camera, you might want to incorporate a follow focus gear that has uh, one of these little moving witness marks on it. So you can set infinity on the wheel and then have it correspond to, you see this little wit witness mark up here? That's the same as the witness mark that would appear on the outside of your lens barrel. Right here. It's the same, it's the same witness mark. Okay, but you got one on the lens and you got one on your focus assist. And depending on, you know, how you're standing around the camera, you can move this so you can see it a little bit better. If it makes more sense to have it mounted there so you can see it a little bit better from slightly behind the camera, you can move your witness mark, but then you got to make sure that when you focus the lens to infinity and you mark infinity on here and it's infinity on the lens, that infinity, the infinity symbol rolls up to the witness mark here to indicate you're focused at infinity, just like you would confirm on the lens barrel itself. And then you have these little extra screw hole, uh, screw locks here and you would lock down so if that was infinity, when you hit infinity on the lens, you'd have a focus stop on your focus assist. Okay, so even though the actual, the actual photographic lens doesn't have hard stops, you can basically create hard stops on your follow focus using these lockdown screws. Okay, usually there's two uh, on a focus assist. You can see there's two holes on the side here. There's another hole for another one. So you can have a a focus stop at infinity and a focus stop at minimum, right? But a lot of these lenses now have so much rate of travel on the focus ring that two hard stops isn't possible. You're gonna go well beyond uh, where two stops would be. So you, I only use one and I have it set for infinity, right? That gives you a sense of you know, where you're at on the barrel. So again, if I have to work the dumb side, and I'm using a lens that has no witness mark. Well, my focus assist has a witness mark. I can set this. So what I would do is I would walk over to the smart side, set the lens to infinity, right? Then walk over here. And I might, with my grease pencil, I might make a barrel mark. I might take my uh, prism color and I might create a witness mark with grease pencil. And that is my visual confirmation on the barrel. It's set to infinity. Then I'll take my focus wheel off that side and install it on this side, right? Calibrate my witness mark to line up with my infinity. And then when I turn it on this side of the camera, when it hits infinity, my witness stop on the follow focus 
will stop the rotation of the lens barrel, okay? And I just got to make sure that all the markings line up, okay? Does that make sense? Am I speaking Greek to you guys now? This is the, this is where the, physical, the physical demonstration is a lot, is a lot more yeah. effective. Yeah, um, I did have a question. So for the um, act of actually focusing, right? So you were talking about the, the, the actor would have like three stops in a scene. So they might be in the foreground and then they'd walk over to the table in the mid, the mid ground and then to the couch in the background and so on. So you'd be focusing with that and you would be making the marks. Would it be possible for a first AC to you not, not really use an autofocus, but program a digital camera that has, you know, the, the autofocus capability to basically tell it, okay, here's this mark, this mark, this mark. So when you go to record, you just hit that button on the recording. And so it would basically become sort of an electronic first AC and like do its own focus button. If it's, you know, not, if you're not going for some really like artsy, like we need this pole to be at exactly this speed and it's more just, we need this focus, then we need this focus. And it doesn't really matter that it, it's more of a range of focus rather than specific within inches, you know? Well, within inches might be all you have for your image to be sharp or out of focus. Okay, especially when you're dealing with low light levels on a set to the point where, you know, your aperture is set to the, the widest opening possible in order to let the most amount of light in as possible in order to ensure that your image has the appropriate brightness. Uh, and when you do that, I'm going to talk to you guys about this, uh, I think in a week and a half, uh, when I cover what's called depth of field. So the aperture inside the lens controls in a lot of ways, it controls the amount of light coming through the lens, but it also, by virtue of uh, creating a diaphragm in the optical, within the optical arrangement of the lens, the amount of focus that's achievable varies with the size of that aperture size. And I'm gonna get into this conversation more uh, down the road here. But suffice it to say that how much information is in focus in front of or behind your subject has to do with what f-stop you're shooting at. And the f-stop changes with lighting, it changes from inside to outside, okay? And it also changes depending on whether a character looks towards a light or away from a light, okay? And how you're exposing that image. Sometimes the amount of focus in front of and behind your subject is inches, right? Sometimes your entire subject's face can't possibly be in focus at the same time because of the aperture you're using to create exposure. You might barely get the tip of the nose and the eye in focus, and that's about it, okay? So unless that robotic actor hits the same point on the floor every time they walk up to deliver that line, you're not gonna be in focus if you rely on the camera and a preset distance that might change through the simple act of uh, a character pausing or stopping short of their mark to deliver their line, you know? So you have to be in that moment, actively controlling that focus as the actors go through their motions and do their thing. Otherwise you run the risk of being out of focus and your entire movie will be soft. Now there are cameras that are starting to work that way. And if you use wider angle lenses and you, and you keep your distances from the camera fairly consistent and significant, like a wide angle lens at six feet or eight feet from the camera, might allow for a, a larger zone of focus around your subject. So as that person is walking towards the camera, you can use a much coarser degree of control over pulling them in from far away to closer to the camera, we call it pulling them into focus, right? Um, there are some times when you can make that situation easier on the focus puller and there are times when that focus puller just needs to be on their game. Uh, having a camera that you have to set is going to imply that you have to take the time to have somebody stand on all those focus marks, program that into the camera, and then hope the actor hits the same marks when they do the, the scene for real. If they don't, it's all for nothing. It's going to be out of focus. 
And if that actor decides to change what they've done from take one to take three and move in a different place on the floor or whatever, it's a very simple thing for the focus puller to run out with a, with a tape and measure the new position the actor wants to stand and deliver the line in. And that can happen pretty fast. But if you had to stop and reprogram a camera to accommodate that so it could do it automatically, that's too much of a time uh, investment nobody wants to make on a film set, okay? So this responsibility has to happen on a timely, in a timely fashion by the first AC while other people are getting their business ready to be shot. The gaffer's lighting the set, the director is directing the characters on where to walk and where to talk, right? The, you know, there's other people that are doing their jobs. And then when the first AD decides they're gonna take one for uh, the film or for the media, everything stops, the actor does their thing. That's take one, but take two, maybe the actor decides, you know what? I'm not gonna stop at the doorway. I'm gonna move through that mark and I'm gonna stop at the sofa and then I'm going to stop short of the dining room table and give the second line that I would have given at the sofa at a midpoint. And then I'm going to give my final line because I think in my performance and the way I'm interpreting the script, that that's how my character would perform this scene. All of a sudden now the first day sees all his marks have changed and you got to go through and make sure now I need to know what, what the focus distance is for the midpoint on the floor. I might have to change some marks on my focus assist or on my lens barrel. And now I have to think about not stopping at the door anymore, stopping at the sofa for half the amount of time, coming to a midpoint, what's that focus, then coming to the dining room table and make sure that I get all of that sharp. You can't program that in time and time and time again without it being a huge waste of time. Okay, that's why it has to be done manually and it has to be done attentively by a focus puller that can handle that kind of stress. And it is stressful. Um, and there's really, there's really no other, no other way around it. If you wanna maintain the creative control over what's in focus and what's out of focus in your shots, if you wanna use in focus versus out of focus as a, as a way of controlling what the audience is seeing so that the director of the story can control the flow of the story and how the audience receives information. If you shoot everything on a wide angle that's sharp everywhere all the time, then what you create is indecision in the audience because they can be distracted by any particular element within the frame, something in the background, something in the foreground, something happening somewhere in the shot that's tangent or totally irrelevant to what the actors are talking about or how they're performing, but it's there in the shot and it's in focus. So the audience, there's going to be somebody who's going to lose track of what the actors are doing and focus on the bird or the car or the airplane or the, you know, the bus in the background in the distance or whatever, because it's sharp and it's there and it's competing with other elements within the frame. And that's a problem. It's a problem for the drama. It's a problem for the, the way the story is told and how the audience receives the information. So this is another reason why we're controlling everything so that if I know where the point of focus is and I know the background will be out of focus, then I must make sure that when the actor hits the mark, the lens is focused to the right distance so that the actor will be clear and visible in the frame for the audience when they deliver the important line. I killed my lover, whatever. And that that moment's not out of focus because if it's out of focus, the audience loses their interest in the film or they lose their engagement or they suspend their disbelief. And then we have a bad film, okay? So we need to control things so that we can control the drama, okay? It's ju it just has to be that way. So um, I don't, there are cameras coming out now that will follow action, which <laughs> makes an operator um, superfluous in some situations. I know that some teachers are using them to videotape their own class presentations so that you can walk around and leave the lectern and not worry about walking out of your own shot when you're recording your lecture. But that's not dramatic camera operating. That's simply the camera following somebody who's gonna move out of frame and then maybe move back into a position that was on frame before. But the focus isn't gonna change. It's gonna stay deep and, and, 
and sharp all the way around because it's just a lecture video. It's not, it's not a murder mystery or it's not an action film where um, sometimes things are out of focus for a reason. We don't want the audience to think about those elements, but they need to be back there to remind us where we are or what we're doing, right? Just out of focus so we won't concentrate on that anymore. We'll concentrate on what's right in front of the camera, okay? Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. So, woohoo. All right, here is focus field. So this is, uh, this is gonna show you, I think it's the rate of rotation between a Canon photographic lens and an Ingenue cinema lens. The action's happening here. You can see there's a little um, uh, cactus in the background and there's a little cactus or an aloe in the foreground. There's a little bottle and then there's a flower in the, we call this in the mid focus field. There's a candle in the middle focus field. And the lens is just gonna range between those minimum and maximum points, the little bottle in the foreground and the cactus in the background. And this video is designed to show you um, the rate of focus travel between the, the cinema zoom and the, uh, the photographic uh, prime lens. Let me show it to you in a big frame here. Can you see that happening? Can you see the cactus in the background get sharp and then get soft again? You see how quick the photographic lens went from minimum to maximum? You can see as well, it's showing you the distance scale up here on top of the Canon lens. So the photographic lenses are doing this a lot quicker. So that may or may not suit the drama that you're trying to create on screen, okay? The Ingenue lens, which is a cinema zoom lens, is giving you a much slower transition, more dramatic transition, so that the moment between the aloe in the foreground and the cactus in the background is extended slightly. It gives the audience time to catch up with what's happening, right? So we see a lot of stuff happening on the screen and the audience is trying to follow all this action. And while they follow the action, they're processing what it means in terms of the story, right? And sometimes the processing speed with which your audience is seeing and understanding what's happening is slower than the reality, right? It happens quicker than we make sense of it, in other words. So this is why we might want to extend a dramatic moment with a slower rate of focus to give the audience the opportunity to stay with us, right? And not get lost in the, in, in the moment or the action or whatever. Okay, these are very important aspects of the craft work of filmmaking that we have to think about. At the end of the day, we are performing a service, telling a story to an audience. And we have to do this in all ways that make it possible for the audience to receive our message the way we want them to receive it, when we need them to receive it, so that their emotional response can be uh, predetermined by what we have decided to show them. We, if we want to make them happy or sad, or if we want them to feel uh, revitalized or depressed, uh, all of that is the result of all of the elements that we have put in place for them and the rate at which we have controlled each of those elements to uh, realize those outcomes. The same way in which the focus needs to be smooth and gradual, so too uh, the control of the aperture inside the lens. So sometimes in the course of a shot, you can see here how the, the uh, aperture controls the size of the hole inside the lens. This is how exposure is controlled. It's also how depth of focus is controlled in front of and behind our subject. Okay, and sometimes, that changes within the course of a shot. Uh, for instance, uh, there was a shot in Once Upon a Time in the West where two guys are talking on the porch of the bar and then they walk into the bar and the bar is very dark. So the lens is gonna go from a small opening outside because of a, an abundance of sunlight 
to a wide opening inside the bar because the bar is darker and the lens now needs to let more information through, more light through to hit your sensor, right? And that happens in the course of the same shot. So what has to happen is the focus puller, not only are they follow focusing the characters from outside in through the door, but they're also going to control the size of the aperture from outside to inside the bar. Okay, sometimes you can pass that uh, responsibility off to the camera operator and just have them roll, we call it rolling the iris open uh, as they pan from outside the bar to inside the bar. The operator will roll the iris open to match the rate with which the characters come through the door and then all the focus puller can continue to, to you know, be attentive to their responsibility of keeping them sharp, okay? So, so it's a similar concept to um, light hitting the eye. So the yeah. dilation of the pupil based on, you know, how much light there is, your eyes have to adjust so that, you know, you don't get like overblown by like, you walk into a dark area, it takes a minute, but then your eyes kind of pick up on what little light there might be. Okay. Yes, but, yes, but we're doing it in real time with the aperture on the lens. I'll talk to you more about that when we go over exposure and depth of field after your midterm quiz. But essentially, if you have to do that in the course of a shot while the shot is happening, you want a smooth iris control that doesn't make any noise and it's very smooth and seamless so that you can do that in the shot and you won't see, all you'll see is the image the, if, if you've done it correctly with the two guys, this was a cowboy film. So the two cowboys are standing on the front, the front porch and it's open sunlight. They talk, the lens is focused on them. Then they come into the bar. And as they come in, as they transition through the doorway, that's where you're going to roll the iris open so that when they come all the way in and maybe the camera pans them into the room, now the lens is looking into the bar into a darker space with a wider open aperture. And it happened in the course of the shot. If you do it correctly, the audience won't perceive any difference. They'll be seeing the cowboys without overexposure outside. And then when they come in, all of a sudden they can see them equally efficiently inside like you would with your real eyes, right? But the camera can't record both things at the same time with the same set of settings because darkness requires different camera settings than outside on the front porch. So all that has to change as the action moves inside. If you're gonna follow those two people through the door into the room from a bright exterior to a dark interior, okay? But you can do it and we do it all the time. But with a photographic lens, if it has manual f-stops at all, a lot of times they are what we call click stops, okay? In other words, inside the lens, there's little indents next to each f-stop adjustment and a little ball bearing that will seat itself inside the indent when you hit each particular f-stop in the range on the lens. And this was so a still photographer, again, who was operating camera like so behind it and through the eyepiece could adjust the aperture on the lens and count the click stops and know what f-stop they were using by the number of clicks it made from left to right or back again without having to necessarily look at the top of the camera and take their eye away from the viewfinder to figure out what they're doing, right? Because that might be just that amount of delay right there might have been a moment missed in front of the camera. So you stay engaged. You're, that's why you're focusing through the viewfinder on a still photographic lens and then just counting your f-stops open and close so you know where you're at so you're controlling your exposure without having to take your eye away from the viewfinder. Photographic use, photographic ecosystem, photographic lens designed for photographic work, right? Cinema lens, different ecosystem, different mode of operation, different people affecting the equipment, different reasons for doing things the way we do them. So the cinema lens is built to accommodate a cinematic approach to creating your images. Okay. Focus breathing. <laughs> okay. Since everything we do is in real time and there's action happening in front of the camera, um, 
the focus is going to shift from the foreground to the background and vice versa or there and back again, depending on the action happening in front of the camera. But funny things happen to the image when we start our focus in the foreground and then throw the focus to something in the background. You may see the image uh, change in some way. And usually it's the scale of objects in the foreground versus objects in the background. They will appear to increase or decrease in size, whether they are in focus or out of focus. And if you focus throw in the course of a shot from the foreground to the background and then back again, you'll see objects in the foreground get bigger and out of focus as objects in the background become sharp and slightly shrink and become sharp. And then when you shift back again, the objects in the background will sort of get out of focus and, and sort of blow it out a little bit again. And the object in the foreground that got big and fuzzy will then contract and get sharp again. That's called focus breathing. And here's a little illustration of that uh, with a coffee cup focused in the foreground. And then there's an object in the middle ground. It's I think a, a beer bottle or something. And then there's something like a baby monitor in the background. And you'll see right now, it's just a white out of focus blob, but we're gonna shift the focus to that object in the background and watch what happens to the scale and the sharpness of the coffee cup in the foreground. Oh, that's weird. Let me do that over again. Oh, hey, 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 hey. <laughs> Keynote has gone crazy. All right. Let's see if I, here, I'm going to show you in this smaller window. Maybe that's part of the problem. Here we go. All right. You see the object in the background. You see how it feels like it's changing shape as it goes from in focus to out of focus and vice versa. Look at the coffee cup. It gets smaller and out of focus in the foreground and then bigger and in focus, depending on whether the focus is set to the foreground or the background. So you can see that in a shot. So if your shot is taking place and the focus throws from the foreground to the background, let's say it's a person in the foreground talking to a person in the background, right? and this person has turned to the camera, maybe they're mixing a cocktail for the person in the background and the camera focuses on the person in the foreground for the line of dialogue. Uh, how do you take your scotch, uh, straight or on the rocks? And then we focus the shot, we throw the focus to the person in the background and the person in the background says, uh, straight with a twist of line, right? For that dialogue and then back to the foreground for the person mixing the drinks and they pick the drinks up and they turn and they walk back into the shot for a two shot, two people, cheers, having a drink of scotch, right? We went from two close ups, one in the foreground and one in the background. And then the person in the foreground moves into the background and maybe the camera backs out into a two shot, let's say, and clink, they clink glasses and they take a drink. But for the, in the beginning of the scene, we want to get, the guy in the foreground asking, how do you take your scotch? And then the guy in the background responding. And when you throw the focus, you get this breathing thing that happens. Okay. This is an optical problem that can be solved with a more expensive lens design. Okay. If you're shooting still photographs, this relationship of breathing never comes into question because you're taking a still image of the person in the foreground and then a still image of the person in the background. And there's no time or transition in between for an audience. It's just two photos you're going to look at one and then the other, right? And so the camera can be set different ways to accommodate those two images. But when you're shooting a motion image for an audience that's going to watch the whole thing happen and watch the transitions, the focus is being thrown in real time while the action is taking place. And if you go from foreground to background and you have a 
a less expensive or or a poorly constructed lens, the breathing will be very noticeable. And it can conceivably be distracting for the audience to see the characters kind of blowing up and shrinking down, blowing up and shrinking down. Cinema lenses, this is one of the things that cinema lens, lenses are built to correct is focus breathing. So uh, a cinema lens like my Rokinon 50 millimeter will demonstrate less of this focus breathing problem than my Olympus 50, 50 millimeter, which breathes a lot because this isn't really designed to shoot video. I can make it shoot video by adapting it, but its original purpose was photography. So they didn't worry about correcting focus breathing in the optical pattern or optical formula for this 50 millimeter lens. But this 50 millimeter lens was built to shoot film and video. And therefore the focus breathing problem has to be adjusted or designed out of this lens by creating a different optical formula for 50 millimeters in a cinema lens. So there might be more glass elements in more groups than in this lens in order to facilitate no breathing from foreground to background when you take your video and shift your focus in the middle of a shot. Okay, focus breathing can be a problem or you can treat it as an advantage. It can be a, a dramatic tool. It's another tool that you can use to isolate moments in time that you want the audience to think about. So if we go back to the example of the focus breathing shot in the James Bond movie, um, let me see if I can find it here really quickly on YouTube. Um, focus breathing James Bond. Uh, <laughs> let's see, let me say, um, Studio Binder. Let's go to YouTube and look for the same thing. Transitions, it might be in here. Writing's not that easy, but Grammarly can help. This sentence is grammatically. The most basic edit you can do is the cut. If I can't find it real quick, I will send you guys a link in the uh, announcements or conversation. How about this, focus throw. Okay, I'll send you guys a link so you can see the scene I'm actually referring to in case you haven't already uh, caught it on YouTube. Um, but this, this can be avoided through lens construction, but it can also be uh, used as a dramatic tool, okay? Okay, you're gonna hear, you're gonna hear, when, especially when we start talking about exposure, I've already started talking about these little markings on the lens as f-stops, right? Well, in actuality, if I wanted to be correct with my nomenclature, you see that little T on the on the ring right there? I should be referring to these as T-stops, not f-stops. Okay. Bear with me because this conversation will make sense over the course of the next come couple of lectures, okay? This control, which is the size of the aperture inside the lens, is, refers, is referred to as f-stop, okay? But on a cinema lens, we refer to those as t-stop adjustments. And the reason why is because on cinema lenses, we wanna know exactly how much light is coming through the lens barrel and hitting the sensor. In a photographic situation, the lenses are manufactured to give us f-stop control on the lens. 
and that's how we make we control exposure and control depth of field in our images okay and we do it one frame at a time in the motion picture sense we want to light our set figure out how much light is there set the lens accordingly right and then shoot a say a wide shot um, an, an establishing shot on a wide lens maybe a 20 millimeter lens actor walks in the door delivers a line walks to the sofa talks to a person on the sofa walks to the foreground delivers a line next to the dining room table we shoot all that on a 20 millimeter lens so we can see all that action happening and then we decide we want to shoot a close-up of the actor doing the same stuff so we change from a 20 millimeter to a, a 50 or a 75 okay and we're going to follow the actor again well the lens has to be set up you mount it on the camera you're going to you know check your focus transfer your focus marks from the 20 millimeter lens to the 75 millimeter lens make sure the distances are still correct by running out your tape the gaffer adjusts the lighting a little bit adds a little bit of diffusion for when the subject comes up to the dining room table okay adds a little bit of diffusion checks yeah it's still the same f stop so we're okay it's still the same t stop so you set that number on the lens okay well with photographic lenses when you change from the 20 to the 75 millimeter um the exposure that's created by adjusting the f-stop might vary slightly at the same f-stop number from the 20 millimeter to the 75 millimeter they might not have the same brightness okay however the cinema lenses with the t-stop adjustment have been calibrated so if you set the lens to f t4 here okay it's the same exposure on the 20 millimeter lens as it is on the 75 millimeter lens. The images do not change in their exposure density because you've changed focal length. But in a 75 millimeter lens, there's like a lot more glass maybe than there is in a 20 millimeter lens. All of the elements like you can see here in this cross section, the arrangement required to make 75 millimeters might be 15 pieces of glass, let's say. And there might only be 10 or 12 pieces of glass in the 20 millimeter lens to get 20 millimeter point of view in a cross section. Okay, the difference in the amount of glass creates a difference in the light that's passing through. Okay, if you took high school physics uh, and they talked to you about the properties of light, they would talk to you about, for instance, light as a particle, as it travels through mediums of different density, will have different frequencies or different intensities, right? Because light passing through a thick piece of glass, in essence, at a, at a microscopic level, gets slowed down by having to pass through air versus pass through glass, okay? And when that happens, less light will pass through the piece of glass in the same interval of time as it would have if it was just passing through open air. All right. And so that difference between those two states of, of flow uh, will result in different exposure calculations for the camera. Okay. So the T-stops are the readjusted reality of light coming through the lens based on how many pieces of glass are in this 50 millimeter lens. And it's different than the number of pieces of glass that are in this 50 millimeter lens. Okay, so f-stop is a formula calculation which we use to control exposure. And the f-stops reflect the formula, the, the results of running all the numbers through the formula in terms of exposure calculation. Okay, F stops, formulaic calculations of this number. And then T stops are transmission calculations of the amount of light coming through the lens to give us exposure. T stops, transmission information, F stops, formulaic information. Formulaic derivatives are less accurate than transmission derivatives. The transmission derivative is calculating exposure based on how much glass the light has to pass through okay so it's a more accurate way of knowing 
when you set this to T4 on the 50 and T4 on the 20, those T stops are going to have the same amount of light coming through that equals the value four or five, six or eight or 11 for your exposure calculation. Just let that marinate, okay? Because I know that I'm talking to you about a bunch of stuff and you're going, what is he talking about? When we talk about exposure and calculating exposure for photographic or video cameras, I'm going to talk more in that realm about those numbers and what they mean. And hopefully a bigger, clearer picture will, will come into view for you, okay? But for now, just understand that there's a difference between the control, the iris control numbers and what they mean on a cinema lens. T stops on a cinema lens, F stops on a photographic lens, okay? So does a spot meter only read F stops or does it also read T stops? Uh -huh, good question. Uh, depends on what spot meter you're using, okay? Uh, I have I have spot meters that will only talk in f stops, and I have spot meters that will talk in t stops, uh, and I have spot meters that will talk in neither of those, and in yet another um, standardization. Okay, it just depends on the meter that you're using, and it depends on how you want to hear the conversation and 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 understand the numbers that you're dealing with. Um, if you're a photographer, T-stops don't really come into play because anything you shoot on the 20 millimeter lens is one image in one frame. And even though you might have two images of the same subject, one shot on 20 millimeter and one shot on 75, when you print them, you can print them to make them look alike. And so it doesn't really matter that the the F stops were slightly different in how they recorded exposure because you, there's a process that you're going to go through to make the prints that takes all of that out of, you know, contention. But in a motion picture where you might be on a zoom lens, let's say, and you're shooting the subject, walk into the room on a 20, and then as they approach the sofa, you zoom in to their close up to 75 millimeters and then they walk to the dining room table, okay? It all happens in real time now. Or you go from a 20 millimeter lens all the way around the room, cut to close up actor walking all the way through the room on a different lens. But then those two shots have to get cut together in the editing process and played back in real time seamlessly from one shot to the next. You don't want the image to be bright, then dark again, bright, then dark again, as you look at the scene in the edit. It's very distracting, right? So the T-stop has to equal on the 20 what it equals on the 75, so that the two pieces of film will match everything. And when you put the edit together, um, you don't see the image getting brighter and darker, brighter and darker. Does that make sense? Thank you. I'm trying to I'm trying to dance all around the rabbit hole with actually falling in <laughs> because we'll do that uh, next week. Uh, let's skip this. Uh, here's the formula for calculating T stops and there's a formula for calculating F stops. You don't have to remember what it is. I just want you to know that uh, all of this is mathematical derivatives, right? So the manufacturers have to know how much light can pass through this lens at what particular aperture size. This one's harder to see. You gotta push this down, that's why. Okay, so this one changes just like the cinema lens, but it has these nasty click stops. And each time you, click it from one size to the next, it kind of jumps from one size to the next. You see that? So you couldn't have, you couldn't pull an iris in video using a still photographic lens like this because you would see the, the incremental changes in brightness uh, when you adjusted this lens. But because the cinema lens has that smooth aperture that just rolls open and rolls closed, you know, you won't see the brightness changes as easily because it's happening more smoothly. And like I said, if you time it correctly through the door from 
outside to inside, right? From outside to inside, you won't really see it if the action is compelling and the actors are giving a really good performance and you'll be able to maintain correct exposure from a bright situation to a dark one. But all of this can be figured out mathematically if you're that inclined, but uh, I don't want you to worry about it. You're not responsible for having to do any of this math. I just want you to see where we get this information from. So every, every one of these numbers printed on the barrel of this lens are the result of bench testing this lens with a fixed amount of light going through it. And the resulting projection on the other side represents rates of change that are derived from this formula. And then we just mark them on the barrel, okay? I was talking about apochromatism a little bit earlier and I was talking about how as light passes through glass, uh, it can diffuse and diffract and it wants to bend away from a straight line and the lenses and all the optics are designed to keep those, uh, those light rays converging on your sensor. In the process of passing from one piece of glass to the other, light can get separated into its principal components and it's all the colors of the rainbow, mostly, but specifically red, blue, and green, uh, light won't line up unless the optics have been precisely created and ground so that all of the different color layers, what we call register uh, on the image sensor correctly. And if they don't, you'll get one prevailing color that represents a little bit of a thin outline around your subject. And it's usually the blue spectrum because it has a different frequency than green and red. Red has a very long wave that passes easily through different densities of glass because the frequency is very low. And then green and blue have higher frequencies. Blue has the highest frequency. And it's kind of like, um, um, you know, if, you, if you're in a swimming pool and you slap the water really hard with your hand because your hand is moving fast through the air, you slap the water and it kind of hurts your hand, right? Because it the hand, encounters resistance on the surface of the water because it's moving so fast. But if you just move your hand slowly, it'll pass right through the water and won't hurt at all, right? Because you're going slower at a slower rate of velocity through the water and the transition is very soft and smooth. Well, frequencies of light passing through different glass of different densities is kind of like slapping the water, right? So a slow frrequency like red passes right through the glass effortlessly, but a high frequency like blue smacks that glass and wants to spray all over. And only some of it gets through the image at the right transmission and in to hit the sensor, right? And sometimes what that manifests in is blue ridges around your subject, okay? Cinema lenses are designed to correct that problem so that you don't get apochromatism. Um, let me show you Matt Granger. In fact, I think it'll be easier if I put Matt up here for future classes. Uh, Matt's gonna talk to you really quick about the difference between F-stops and T-stops. Um, he has an Australian accent, so he could be a little bit hard to understand but give it a shot, see what you think, and see if it makes that topic any clearer for you. When is an aperture of two not really a two? Well, when the F number doesn't match the T number. Photographic cameras are generally measured in F, F2.8, F4, whereas cinema lenses are normally measured in T. Today, I want to explain what the difference is. In case you don't know, one of the controls you have over the exposure in your camera is your aperture. And the aperture is normally measured in photography circles in terms of f-stops. And it's determined by the size of the diameter of the circle that the blades of the lens allow how much light they allow to come through. And we talk about f2.8, f2, f1.4, f8, all of these different numbers which signify a certain amount of light. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's how much light is getting to your sensor. The difference between an f-stop and a t-stop is an f-stop is measured at the size of the opening at the front of the lens and that's easy to measure. 
A T-stop is a bit trickier to measure. It's actually how much light having passed through the aperture, through the elements in the lens, how much actually gets to your sensor. And that's something different because you do lose some light along the way. For people who are into cars, an analogy could be measuring horsepower at the flywheel or measuring it at the wheel. Once it's gone through the system, how much is there practically being put onto the ground? It's exactly the same with aperture. All the different lenses inside, or glass elements we call lenses, that are inside the overall lens that you're using, do steal a little bit of light. Reflections steal a little bit of light. It's actually impossible to have a 100% transmission ratio. So even the best coded lenses that ref, you know eliminate reflections and all of those things will still steal a little bit of light. Whether or not it's enough to really make a difference, it will steal a little bit, but sometimes it steals a whole lot. I'm sure you would have seen product photos like this guy where they're showing beautiful detail inside the lens. And whilst that's nice graphically and to show you the complexity of the lens, the fact that you can see all of those different lenses inside the lens body means that's a reflection and that's light that isn't passing through and hitting the sensor. So that's loss of light essentially because it's being bounced back at you. Okay, so even lenses like this beauty, the Canon 85 1.2, which you really can't see a whole lot in the way of lenses inside, and you're paying a whole lot of money for the 1.2, and it is a well-built lens, you're still losing some light on this. This one actually has a T-value of 1.4. That means that even though it will open up in terms of aperture an F number of 1.2, you're losing 0.2 on the way through the lens and only 1.4 of light is coming out the other end. That is not to say that it affects the depth of field or the out of focus areas. That is actually affected directly to the size of the aperture opening. But the amount of light that's coming through that you have to work with in terms of your exposure, balanced with your shutter speed and ISO, that's T value. That's not to say, oh, well, if it's only giving me 1.4 of light, I might as well just buy the 1.4, because of course the 1.4s lose light as well. For example, the... Le no, not for example. <laughs> I'm gonna stop in there. The whole video is on web courses on your video page. Um, and you can watch that at your leisure. Um, but I don't want to get too far into that conversation. Um, I feel like I'm already maybe overwhelming some of you with some of this information and I don't want to uh, muddy the water too badly. Um, I showed you the uh, formula for T-stop. Uh, this is F-stop divided by the square root of transmittance. Well, it's all talking about this relationship in the lens, right? The diameter of your front element or your optic how far the focal distance of the lens is from the front element to the uh, sensor or the film plane. Uh, and when you divide those two numbers into one another and take the square root of this one, uh, or no, I'm sorry, the square root of this one, um, you end up with all those numbers that are printed on the outside of your lens, okay? Which are the numbers that we can derive from this formula. Um, it's all been figured out mathematically by the manufacturer, so we don't have to deal with those situations. All we have to do is deal with those numbers when we calculate exposure. Um, we can defer exposure calculation to the camera. Most cameras have a light meter inside that will take over that responsibility if you want to give the camera that responsibility. But again, just like focus, I don't want the camera, which is a, an electronic device with no opinion and no creative impulses. I don't want that device making dramatic choices for me out of context. Uh, I would rather calculate exposure myself uh, using a light meter and set the camera accordingly based on how much light I've put into the set and set my lens accordingly uh, and don't allow the camera to misinterpret what I want my lighting to do or how I want the audience to feel when they see that lighting or to misinterpret my idea of too bright or too dark with the camera's sort of out of context notions of what is too bright and too dark. I don't want devices making choices for me that have to do with drama and emotional feedback with the audience. Okay, does that make any sense? I don't, in other words, I don't trust the camera to make the right choices for me in automatic. What does a camera know about drama? Nothing. The camera only knows what I tell it. And it only does 
what I set it to do. It can't set itself with any conscious knowledge of what those settings are for and what they're supposed to render, the emotion they're supposed to render. Only I can figure that out and only I can demonstrate that for the audience. So I have to be the one that takes responsibility for setting the camera's exposure settings, setting the lens properly and so forth. Okay. Um, the last thing I wanna to talk to you about about the physical construction of lenses is how they actually attach to the camera. So um, PL mount, I mentioned positive locking mount. Um, cinema lenses uh, in the past were predominantly positive locking lenses. In other words, the way they fit onto the camera and mount in place was a certain kind of a flange uh, where photographic lenses are designed to work a little bit differently. They have what we call uh, a bayonet mount. Uh, you push a button to release um, a notch and the lens turns and comes off the camera so that you can replace it with other uh, focal lengths, other magnifications, and then you put it back on in the reverse action, right? So photographic lenses were designed to be changed out a lot because people out documenting things out in the field might want a strong magnification at one point in time and a wide magnification at another point in time. And it's based on what you see happening in front of the lens. So you're changing lenses a lot. Um, the bayonet, positive locking bayonet is a little bit quicker process of getting a lens on and off a camera than a PL lens. A PL lens mount is designed to be very firm and strong to hold because a lot of the cinema lenses are fairly large and heavy and they're placing a lot of burden on the lens mount of the camera. So for instance, if I take this off, you've got the mount, the, the, the lens is mounted to the camera here I have it supported by the map box as well. So it's a fairly solid system. Some map boxes don't connect to the front of the lens. Like my red, my red rock over here that's designed to swing open in the front, it can't mount to the front of the camera if I want the map box to swing up and out of the way to change a lens, for instance. This way has a little bit more support by mounting the front of the lens to the map box and the back of the lens to the camera. Um, so I'm okay with an EF photographic lens mount on this, on this lens and for this camera, okay? But if I had a really big, say, ingenue uh, cinema zoom on the front of my Blackmagic camera, I probably wouldn't want an EF mount because there's not a lot of, uh, there's not a lot of metal holding the lens in place. You can see these little, they're called bayonets right here, these, these little, parts that are designed to go into the lens mount and click into place to keep the lens from falling off. But that little bit of metal right there is not gonna support a lens maybe that weighs you know, 20, 25 pounds. So <laughs> to have a photographic lens flange on a cinema lens that's that big uh, doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, in recent years, the manufacturers have figured out ways of getting cinema lenses and cinema lens products a lot smaller and a lot lighter. Uh, as a result of that, they've been able to put EF photographic flanges on motion picture lenses and not have to worry about the lenses falling off the front of the camera. Um, but when this whole process started, uh, the equipment was much bigger, much heavier, and we are evolving over time as this conversation uh, occurs. But if you look at a photographic lens flange here, for instance, here's a Canon photographic flange. This is the EF flange. Here's a Nikon. It's very similar. It has contacts as well to transfer lens data between the camera and the lens. And that gets recorded in, in between your images on image files called metadata. Okay. The PL mount has no electronic contacts on it. And it has four big beefy flanges on it, whereas the still lenses only have usually three, one, two, three, you see. So there's an extra flange that'll hold the lens in place. They're thicker. Uh, it's made out of stainless steel a lot of times, whereas the photographic ones are chrome plated brass. So brass is a softer metal. 
it's softer so that the fit and finish of a lens going on a photographic camera feels very smooth and very precise the way it clicks on, right? Um, the photographic lens fits on with the same kind of precision, but it has to fit on, lock on, and not be able to get ripped off by the physical manhandling of the equipment as it moves around the set and as it, as it does different things, right? So uh, the PL mount is a little bit more robust and allows for better contact with the camera. Okay, it doesn't mean that a lens with a PL mount is a better lens than anything else. Um, a lot of YouTubers have gotten caught in the trap of, of presenting the information in such a way that they, they make it sound like lenses that have PL mounts are, are better lenses than lenses with photographic mounts. And the style of mount is no guarantee or indication of the quality of a lens. Okay, the quality of the lens is purely a, uh, uh, the result of manufacturing of the optics themselves and the way the lens is put together. Um, and how it connects to the camera body is irrelevant to the way the optics are fabricated. Okay, so just because a lens has a PL mount on it or just because a camera has a PL mount on it doesn't mean that that system is gonna guarantee you any better image quality. Now, 30 years ago, you might be able to say that might be true, but in the modern era with our manufacturing capabilities and uh, with computer assisted engineering of products and the way we assemble products and the whole quality process has gone up exponentially. And so we have motion picture lenses now that have Canon EF photographic mounts on them because in the digital era where cameras and lenses have gotten a lot smaller, um, we have camera manufacturers, photographic manufacturers like Canon, who used to only make still cameras. Now they make motion picture cameras also. Um, and since the EF flange is their product, they put the EF flange on their motion picture cameras, just like they do on their photographic cameras. And so the cinema lenses that are going to work on the Canon C-Series 100, 300, 500, 700, um, the cinema lenses are going to need to have EF mounts on them to fit on the Canon digital film cameras. Does that mean the Canon cinema lenses are not as good a quality as say the Airy lenses that have PL mounts on them? Not necessarily, no. Um, and that's a credit to the modern manufacturing capabilities that we have now. Uh, so PL positive locking mount is nothing more than a means of mounting the lens to the camera and it's no metric for gauging quality, okay? Okay, so that's all I wanna to talk to you about in terms of lenses. The next couple of cells I have are gonna be particular to part of your homework assignment. And your homework assignment, if I bop over to uh, web courses really quick, uh, let me go to 1.6 and show you the assignment, your first shooting assignment, okay? Uh, what you're gonna do is you're gonna shoot some shots uh, at different fields of view, wide, uh, medium, and close up, uh, one extremely close up. And then I'm gonna want you to uh, do a motion shot where you're gonna shift focus and I believe it's, um, Oops, where is it? Okay, create. Okay, a wide shot, a medium shot, a close up, complete, compose a, an insert shot, and then compose a frame with two separate objects and two different focal planes, foreground and background, for instance, and demonstrate a focus throw between the two. Okay, so you're gonna give me five shots for this assignment. These are shots, they can have movement in them or not, it doesn't really matter, but you're gonna shoot a wide one, a medium, a narrow, and a very narrow close-up shot, okay? And you're gonna do it with some dramatic context. So don't give me a series of random shots that just demonstrate angle of view. 
give me a series of shots that might be able to be edited together into something and mean and have meaning, right? So in this example here, we've got man walks up to a cafe, medium shot. Well, this is really a long shot of two people sitting at a table, medium shot of a closer angle on the conversation, close up shot of the reaction, really close up shot of the eyes following motion in the background. And then an insert shot is usually a shot that involves, for instance, a uh, person checking the time of day. So you could do uh, a medium shot. Hey, what time is it? Uh, I don't know, let me check my watch. And then we see the eyes in close up. And then the next shot is the watch in close up. So we see what the eyes are seeing, right? The shot of the watch is called an insert, right? This, the close up of the eyes is called an extreme close up, not an insert because this is the reaction shot. It's what the eyes see inserted into the sequence of shots. Does that make sense? So the watch is the insert, okay? So you're gonna do a series of shots like that and then do one where you have an object in the foreground and an object in the background and just focus throw between them, okay? If you are using your cell phone as your capture device, uh, you're going to need manual control of your camera on your cell phone to do this homework assignment. So if you don't already have an Android, for instance, that gives you manual control over your cell phone or the most recent version of the Apple phone, what you have to do is go to your, um, your app store and look for uh, a free application, preferably, that gives you manual control over your camera. So for instance, if we go to um, Google and say um, apps for manual control of camera phone. Here, look at this. What are the best manual uh, camera apps for Android? Or the seven best manual camera apps for Android? Um, we just click on one of those and it'll give you some suggestions. I tend to go for the free stuff. I don't like to pay for apps for a telephone, um, but that's up to you. Uh, here's open camera. It's free. It gives you manual control over your exposure and over your f-stops and over your focus. Um, footage. <laughs> also free. Stop it. Camera zoom. They want $399, camera FV5 wants $395. So there's two free ones for Android here. Um, like I said, if you have a recent Android uh, phone, you probably already have manual control uh, within the camera system of the phone already because Android realized about a year ago what people were doing with their phones because their cameras on the Android phones are really good. And Android made their own app and it comes loaded into the phone already. So um, if I change apps for manual control of Apple camera phone, let's see what we get. ProCam 7, that's the seventh generation of the application for Apple phones, ProCam. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's free. Uh, let's see here. Here's Visco, doesn't say, oh yeah, free, here we go. ProCam 7 is uh, $7.99. There used to be a free version of ProCam. Check and take a look around. You might be able to find the free version. It might be a, um, a watered down version of ProCam. You know, ProCam does a lot of stuff. There's a lot of feature capability in the program, the ProCam app that you don't need, especially for this assignment. So there might be like, um, there might be a uh, promotional app or there might be uh, an app that, a demo app or something, a program that you can download for free. Uh, and then it'll want you to upgrade, say after a week to program seven or something, just don't bother upgrading. Um, this is supposed to be the best app for manual control of the camera on an Apple phone. Uh, and it doesn't come standard with the Apple phone. So you gotta download it from somewhere. Um, 
let's see this one's also 7.99 it looks like most of the apple apps now this one's only 2.99 this is uh camera legacy camera plus legacy um 199 slow shutter cam you don't need that we're looking for focus manual focus control so you want to pick an app that gives you manual focus control specifically pro cam will give you that hydra oh hydra's five bucks now manual raw there's apps out there take a look look in your app store uh on your phone try that first and search for uh manual camera apps for your iPhone or your Android. Okay. So you'll need that to do at least your focus throw for this assignment. Probably not for the rest of this, but definitely for the focus throw. All right. And then what you're going to do is put it all in a timeline. You can use i iVideo if you want, if you're using an Apple phone or I'm sure Android has their own version of it of an editing platform, or you can use Premiere if you've already taken editing class or Final Cut, whatever you wanna do. Just take all your clips, put them on a timeline, you know, bump them all up next to each other. You don't have to edit them necessarily. Just put them on there in a sequence, download that as a video clip and upload it to YouTube, and then just give me a link, okay? So when you submit, you're basically uh, going to give me a PDF with some thumbnails that are marked wide shot, long shot, medium shot, close up shot, insert. Um, and then you're going to give me a link on that PDF to go to YouTube and look at your video so I can see your focus throw shot. Okay. Uh, and that's your assignment. And I think I give you two weeks to do it. So, um, well, two weeks in a normal semester. So, uh, you'll have to get this done by, what's my due date here? July 25th. So you got 10, you got 11 days to do it. Available today and it's due on the 25th. Okay. So that's your first shooting assignment. Now, your shooting assignment. Remember I talked to you about equipment that they have at school that you guys can check out and use for your projects. This is a perfect opportunity for you to uh, check out an FZ1000, a Panasonic Lumix camera. That's the one that we have for you guys for this class, right? Nice little cameras. I like them a lot. Uh, I've done a fair amount of shooting with this one already. And um, I, I think it's great. Uh, as far as uh, all in one unit, don't have to worry about extra lenses and stuff. Fits really good in a knapsack. I can take it with me to the beach and pull it out if I see something I want to get some video or photos of uh, without a lot of extra superfluous gear. So uh, we have 30 of these available uh, through the equipment uh, room at UCF that you can check out. Okay, it's first come, first serve. And there's a protocol. Uh, for you to check out gear. So uh, this is what they wanted us to do uh, in the spring. I think he's got a new protocol in place, which you can uh, check out on the portal. Remember I showed you guys the UCF film program has an operational portal. You go to the operationalportal.com and, and look up the process for renting equipment from UCF, or you can call Devin uh, at UCF and you can have him uh, direct you to the appropriate instructions link on their website or uh, he might even tell you over the phone. Their phone number is at the bottom of each page of the instructions I put here for you. Okay, so if you want to, you can check out a camera from UCF and shoot your assignment. If you've already got a camera, you can do it with that. And like I said, if your cell phone is your preferred device to shoot video with, you'll have to get a manual control app off, off the internet, okay? So you got three choices with which to conduct your assignment, whichever one you decide is up to you. I recommend this route and checking out the Lumix camera from UCF. Uh, you'll get to meet the people in the equipment room. You'll get to familiarize yourself with their process. Um, they will 
get to know you in terms of a client um, and you will form a little relationship that will uh, serve you throughout the course of your uh, film program career here at UCF. You're going to go there eventually and, and rent something from them. Uh, it's free if you're in the film program. You don't have to pay them. Um, I call it renting because it's the easiest word to use in this context, but you're basically checking out gear. They got lights, cameras, lenses, all kinds of stuff. Uh, and so this will help break the ice. You'll get to know them and what they've got available, meet them, they meet you. It's a good, it's a good situation if you can get to campus. So because we're in, a, we're in the remains of the COVID protocol, I guess, for this semester, uh, some of you might not be in Orlando, so it might not be um, uh, um, feasible for you to go, go to UCF campus and check out gear. If that's the case, don't worry about it. Uh, choose another device. If you've got a camera at home that shoots video, you can use that as long as you have control over the focus. Um, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I was going on the link for the UCF.ZeusNow portal, mm -hmm. and it prompts you with a login, and I'm using my UCF login, and it's not working. Uh, they might want you to use a new code. I think he was talking something about that, Devin. Um, so send Devin an email, I guess, and ask him for your classroom code. And their email is... Uh, Film operations at ucf.edu, right here. See that? Ask them if they've got a code that they want us to use now. I think he was talking about maybe going to that kind of system. And I haven't, okay. seen, I haven't seen Devin in a couple of weeks. So um, if he has a code, he'll give it to you. Um, I'll give him a call too and see what they got going on with that um, and see if they changed how it, how it has to work now. They have a whole paperwork system and, and it's like a menu. You you pick the items you want to check out from them and it automates on their end and it creates an order that then their people will pull out of the equipment room and make sure that it is ready to go, uh, ready to be picked up when you come in at your appointed time. Um, and then your code is simply your customer code, I guess. Uh, and it, it will have something to do with our class. So everybody in, in our Cinematography one summer session class might have a very similar code or a, the same code with a prefix or something. Um, we'll see what they want to do and uh, whatever they ask for, just just do whatever they ask. Um, this is good because they might change these protocols from semester to semester. So whatever you do now, you know, may or may not be the way moving forward in the fall or next spring or whatever which is why you need to have a relationship with these folks, okay? Just like you would with a real rental house on the outside when you're in the real world. You know, when you deal with a rental house, um, you need to know those people, they need to know you. It builds confidence in the relationship and they can be a, a huge help to you sometimes if you're trying to figure out what kind of gear to use or what the best gear to use or what they're, what amongst the gear that they offer, what would be the best piece for your project. And a lot of times you can get good advice uh, if you're on a, you know, conversational basis with these folks. So it's, uh, it's a relationship you need to nurture. So we might as well start now, I guess. Right. Um, so I, I recommend this option if you, if you can get to campus, but if not for this assignment, it's not going to be a big deal. All right. As long as you have manual control for the focus of whichever device you choose to use. Uh, here's a quick glimpse at the rubric if you care about how I'm breaking down the assignment. Um, but remember, it's available now as of the end of class today, and it's due on the 25th. All right. That pretty well covers it for today. So and I had a quick question about the assignment itself. Uh -huh. You mentioned sort of um, setting up the shots in a way that, that shows some sort of uh, drama or narrative going on, right? Not just haphazard shots, but like, you know, shot, like, like properly composed scenes. Um, what exactly are you looking for past the mechanical of like, okay, this has to be in, fo in focus on the first object, then to the second, then back, and then so, so past that, what kind of narrative are you looking for as a baseline? I'm not looking for a particular narrative, okay? The narrative is up to you. You're a filmmaker. You should have ideas by now. You're in 
school to learn how to facilitate those ideas, but right. the story, the narrative, whatever you want to call it is up to you. The only parameters I'm giving you are I want to see a wide shot of your story, a long shot, which is slightly closer, uh, a medium shot, which is getting into a conversation of some kind, whatever it is, a close-up reaction shot. This guy says something, she reacts to it. Medium, close-up, closer still, and then an insert of some detail, okay? I've had people that, you know, do something as simple as, you know, one friend sitting at a picnic table, the other friend walks up and says, sits down and says, hey, what time is it? And the other person says, oh, I don't know, let me check my watch. They give you an insert shot, we see what time it is, and then a close-up response shot, it's three o'clock, okay? It can be something as simple as that. Okay, I don't that, that's, yeah, I, um... I kind of when when you mentioned the insert shot, I immediately started to think, okay, well, if he wants an object that's in the foreground, that like it, you want like a focus throw from one or the other, like something of like me, I'm in bed, I you know, like it sees me in bed, and then the the phone, like the alarm's about to go off, and so the focus switches, and the alarm goes off, and then I get up a medium, and then get the close up, it shows the phone, something something along those lines would be. You're the storyteller in this right. case. I don't okay. care what you shoot. I want you to demonstrate focusing on something in the foreground to something in the background, okay? Right. And if you can incorporate the mechanics of that objective into one of the shots for your little quick story idea, that would be ideal, right? Okay? And so, the, so the main objective then is to, to demonstrate the technical aspect of like focus here, then focus over here, like just to demonstrate that we know how to control the focus. Yeah, it, it's, it can be as simple as that, but the, the idea here is all of the mechanics and all of the skills that I'm teaching you are not for their own sake. They are in support of the stories you wanna tell me. So I want you to show me, this is an opportunity for you to show me, to, to begin to show me how your brain thinks about stories and what you what you try to see when you're telling a story, how you tell that story, and what skills you use to affect me as your audience. Okay, so it it really has some complex objectives buried in a very simple assignment, and so you could take it at face value and give me a bunch of garbage shots, you know, that just show me wide, medium, and tight, and a focus throw on an apple and a soda can. I've had people that have treated this assignment with that level of disinterest and disengagement. Okay, but if you do that, it says more about you as a filmmaker than it does about you a technician. Okay, because you can give me beautifully executed focus throws of crap. Okay, and that speaks more about your lack of imagination or your unwillingness to demonstrate other aspects of your filmmaking prowess, like your storytelling ability. Okay, and remember, every time you do an assignment for a class in the film program, you should treat it as an opportunity to create something that you won't be embarrassed to show a potential employer when after you graduate. Okay, every assignment is an opportunity for you to create an asset that you can add to a portfolio or a reel, okay, that you're going to then use as a calling card or use as a as a topic of conversation in a job interview when you get outside into the real world. So <laughs> here's where, you know, I can get very disappointed when I see somebody give me a homework assignment where they shot their stuffed teddy bear on their bed in their bedroom. Are you gonna show a client? If you wanna get a job working for a production company where they're potentially gonna pay you 50 grand a year to work on their video staff, are you going to show them videos of your stuffed bear on your bed at home? Is that going to make any kind of impression on a professional, potential professional employer? I wouldn't think so. So use these opportunities to really start exercising your storytelling muscle, right? And start treating these assignments as opportunities instead of liabilities, right? Everybody goes, oh, I got so much homework to do. Yeah, but a shooting assignment is a different kind of responsibility. A shooting assignment is your opportunity to start showing me something 
that might differentiate you as a storyteller from your other classmates. And it gives us all a sense of who you are as a filmmaker, all right? But if you give me a minimum effort, then you're gonna get a minimum grade. You know, that's all there is to it. Um, that's the process. So I, I hope that you'll put a little effort into this and, and show me something. Now I'm not asking for gone with the wind, right? <laughs> I don't expect you to be, uh, you know, a totally proficient filmmaker at this stage in the game, right? And I can usually tell when somebody's trying and when somebody's blowing this assignment off, I can tell, right? So, you know, it's really up to you, but I would hope that you would seize on the opportunity to do something really creative. And I have some folks that really go to great lengths for these assignments. And it gives me a sense of who they are, what, you know, how they like to work, what kinds of subject matter they like. I'm not going to limit you in terms of what story you want to tell me. So if you, you know, if you're really interested in horror movies and you want to shoot something that has a horror theme, uh, but demonstrates these shots for me, I, I say go for it, you know, because in the final analysis, you might create something in the next 10 days that looks really sweet and you can put it on your reel in your capstone class and start preparing for job interviews when you get out of school and you'll you might show that uh, to potential employers if you do a good enough job with it uh, and there'll be plenty of opportunities between now and the time that you graduate to take all this material and polish it and incorporate it into other projects you know um it's really up to you. I, I try not to limit in that respect so that if you've got a, a pet project that you're already working in other classes on and you need, you're going to take this opportunity to use this assignment to show me what I need to see, but it also might end up being a scene you're going to cut into a, an actual film project that you're working on in another class. That's okay too. As long as I see the, the skills that demonstrated that I need to see, um the story is 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 up to you okay i'm hoping that that doesn't create anxiety with anybody i'm trying to free you up of un, unrealistic or or um unreasonable constraints um i could give you i could tell you exactly what to shoot you know and give you you know, and then somebody will have a problem. Like, you know, I don't have a Pepsi can at home or I don't have a kitchen table or I don't have a whatever, you know. Um, and then and then I've alienated somebody. So it's really up to you. I have a question about lenses. Yeah. So we talked a lot about like uh, focus, pulling and everything. And uh, I did my report on John Alcott because I feel like Barry Lyndon is one of the most beautifully shot films I've ever seen. Yeah. And a part of that is because his use of zooms in that film to me is like, I love zooming. And I feel like today we're doing less zooming and more dolly shots and on my gh5 kit lens the zoom is sticky like it's hard to get fluent zoom our zoom away from zooming zooming uh well zooming was a technology that you know was introduced to the industry and people latched onto it because it was a new thing and everybody wants to, you know, everybody's always looking for the new thing and they want to try it and they maybe want to incorporate it into something that they're working on. So the idea of zooming into a shot was something that only came along uh, in the late sixties, early seventies, probably, probably the early seventies. Um, before that it was prime lenses only one focal length at a time if you needed something wider or something narrow where you had to change lenses right and then the zoom lens uh, was introduced to the cinema industry and all of a sudden people thought wow we can change the focal length we could do that while we're while we're shooting you know and the slam zoom was born you know guys like quentin tarantino have looked at that aspect reminiscent in movies like um, 
Django Unchained, he used the smash zoom a lot uh, to go from a, a, a wide or a long shot to a close up. Like when we meet Leo's character for the first time and he smash zooms to Leo on the sofa, right? The beginning of Hawaii Five O was was festooned with smash zooms. The whole series used smash zooms all the time because Hawaii Five O in the um, I think it was like in the really early seventies, uh, late sixties maybe, um, was a fashionable TV show. It was considered cutting edge, and so this new capability came out, and of course they were going to latch on to it. Uh, and they were going to exploit it because like their show was new and innovative, they took an innovative new technology and they wanted to incorporate it into their storytelling. Um, over time, it becomes a cliche. And then over decades, it becomes shot out or tired, we call it. You know, nobody wants to see the zoom in a shot anymore. But the reality is we do a lot more zooming than you think we do. Um, in situations all the time. But what we do now is something called burying the zoom. In other words, I, ta I gave you an, an, an example of two cowboys on the front porch talking, right? And they're gonna enter into the bar through the door, right? Well, when we got the two guys on the porch outside, maybe we're shooting them on a 35 millimeter lens, but you might back up on a 35 in a rehearsal. And as you come through the door, realize when you're looking into the bar now, you're seeing a lot more on that 35 millimeter than you really want to see. Or the gaffer comes to you and says, look, man, if you want to see the inside of this place, uh, I've got a light more stuff on a 35 than I have to on a 50. Or the production designer might say, hey, man, you can't stay on a 35 all the way through that shot because we didn't decorate that whole wall inside the bar because we were told this was an exterior shot. Now you're bringing him into the bar. I don't mind because that wall has been decorated because we might have seen it through the open door when we did coverage on the porch. But this wall over here, we never would have seen from the porch through the door. So we didn't paint it or we didn't decorate it or whatever. So then you might have to say, okay, I'm going to start on a 35 on the porch, but as I come through the door, I'm going to bury a zoom from 35 to 50. So when I come around on a raking two shot of two guys standing, looking at the bartender, I'm, a, I'm now on a 50, right? And the focus puller will have to manage that zoom in the middle of the shot, as well as keeping them in focus, which is complex and hard to do, but that's part of the job. And so we'll do that. We do that all the time in movies. And you probably don't see it because it's not designed to be seen by you as an audience. We do it to facilitate making our job easier and making our compositions more seamless in the way they flow one shot to the next. But we don't want you to pay attention to it. We don't want to call attention to the Zoom. So we try to hide it from you. The smash Zoom, the stuff Tarantino does and the stuff they did on Hawaii Five-0 uh, and other shows like that, was lifting the cinematic veil, okay? It was, you know, they were stepping outside of what they call the diegetic or the story of the film and showing you something that re was totally unrelated to the story. And that was, we're showing you the new technology of zoom lenses by going wank and zooming into Leo DiCaprio sitting on the sofa, right? That's totally non-diegetic filmmaking and that, that has to do more with fashion than it has to do with standards of storytelling and the traditional modes of storytelling. So that's why the smash zoom and the zooming shots have kind of fallen out of favor with filmmakers because it does what we call suspending the audience's disbelief. We, they stop thinking about the story and start thinking about the zoom shot, right? It calls attention to itself. You know, so you have to do it in certain places where it kind of makes sense. Uh, what you'll learn later on in the photographic, in your photographic education here at the end of this class and in cinematography too, I'm going to show you how backgrounds will change dramatically from a wide angle lens to a telephoto lens. You can do something that Spielberg does all the time, which is called a reverse zoom. He dollies out while zooming in on the zoom lens. And the subject stays the same size in the frame, but the background all of a sudden goes, right? You see that weird background effect? That's a zoom shot, okay? 
but because they kept the subject the same size relative to the frame, your brain doesn't immediately pick up on that notion. And instead it just goes, whoa, the background did just something really funky. That's designed, that shot is designed to give you a specific emotional response, okay? And so when you see that, it calls attention to itself. When it calls attention to itself, it's possible that the audience will stop believing that Indiana Jones is really in trouble when he gets on the rope bridge. And they'll think about how they shot the zoom shot. How do they keep him the same size when the background came up and looked like it was gonna smack him in the back of the head, okay? So the zoom shot has kind of fallen out of favor for that reason. What we have started to embrace as filmmakers is an experience where the camera becomes another character in the process of the story. And so the camera sees the world of the movie the way the other characters see it. And the other characters wouldn't see a smash zoom or a reverse zoom any more than we do as the omnipotent camera in that universe, right? So we create an immersive uh, environment for the audience in that respect. The camera becomes the audience moving through our world, moving through our story. So you don't zoom in your life, you know, you, when you order a low fat, uh, you know, latte at Starbucks, we don't smash zoom into the person behind the counter saying 495, please. It just, that's not something that happens in our reality. So we won't want to see that in our films either. It's not a dogmatic uh, approach to filmmaking, but it is an immersive, pragmatic choice to not use those cliches like a, you know, a zoom in for that. But there might be a situation where physically you can't get any closer to a subject. Like if you're on the side of a mountain in the desert and you want to look at a guy riding on towards you on a camel, a slow, steady zoom in to isolate that detail over several seconds or a minute or several minutes. Um, might be something that you can justify and hope that the audience will accept that as a, a rudimentary solution to overcoming a demonstrative problem, which is how are you going to get from the side of a mountain a mile away right up into a medium or a close-up shot of a guy on a camel without moving in on the zoom lens? You, you know, you're not going to be able to do that. So it's a practical solution that sometimes becomes necessary based on the problems of logistics on set. Um, but you wouldn't necessarily wanna do it as an aesthetic choice unless you're shooting a movie and you want the tone of that movie to have the same feel uh, as the period the story takes place. Like if you're doing a, a hip retro movie about something going on in the 70s, you might wanna shoot that show or that movie in the same mode that filmmakers in the 70s might have shot it. So you might use tropes like a smash zoom as part of your compositional choices to add that extra layer of, of, um, of authenticity to your period film, you know? Uh, that's done a lot, um, especially movies that take place in the 70s, like in Boogie Nights, for instance, and movies like that. Uh, they'll put in those kind of campy shots because they were really popular kinds of things to do at the time. And filmmakers never thought, you know, twice about a smash zoom in the 70s because everybody was, you know, wanting to try the zoom lenses. So they were all over the place. And if you're doing a movie about the 70s, but it's in 2021, you might want to incorporate 70s style lighting and 70s style uh, wardrobe and 70s style camera techniques to reinforce the idea that your story is taking place in 1972, not 2022. You know what I'm saying? So it's also a, a contextual thing. Did I take you the long way around the block on that question or did I answer effectively? Uh, well, I guess I was just wondering too, because like I said on my Lumix lens, that Zoom, even if I was say to try to vary the Zoom, it would be very challenging because it's like it's a sticky sort of process like i can't get a smooth what motion and I, um i don't know off the top of my head exactly but i know it's like a lumix okay so for instance, here's a lumix 14 to 42 kit zoom right 
And if I was just taking photographs and I needed to go from 14 to 42, so I had a narrower or a wide angle point of view of a still image, this lens is totally fine. But to work on it in a movie, it would be a disaster, okay? For a lot of reasons. A, it's too small. B, it has no markings on the outside of the lens to tell me what's going on at all. C, it changes shape when I change focal length. I can't do that if the front matte box is married to the lens and the body on the other side is married to the lens. This can't happen. So my lenses all have to be what we call internal focus. Okay, so this is a barrier to using it for effective video. If I'm using matte boxes and rod systems, uh, it's really got a really small front diameter, right? So the filters are really, really small. Um, you know, there's no end to the reasons why not to use this zoom, unless it's the only one I got and I got to shoot today. Then I have to work around all of these limitations. All right, but if I want to take this lens off and use this capture device because I like what it does on a commercial for Saab, let's say, then I'm going to take this lens off, throw it in the trash, and I'm going to pull out one of my cinema zooms, and I'll show you the difference. So here's, uh, where are they? Let me show you a DZO lens with a similar focal length. Uh, in a cinema zoom lens, and you're going to see the difference. So what is that? That's a 14 to 42. They don't compare exactly, but here's a 20 to 70. Here's a 20 to 70 cinema zoom lens that would also go on the GH4 or GH5. Okay, it's obvious already the differences between these two devices. This one's all, you know, marked up with focus and f-stops and zooms. Everything is very smooth, right? Hand fitted, right? Much, much bigger filter diameter on the front, threaded, internal focus. This lens doesn't change shape if I go from 20 to 70. You see that? Stays the same shape. My matte box can marry on and not move. The camera can be on this end. The whole system functions, does everything it needs to do without changing shape. It's bigger. I have a longer rate of rotation for my focus puller so they're not pulling their hair out with a little tiny photographic lens. Everything about this product says filmmaking and everybody, everything about this product says photography, okay? But if this is all I got, I got to make this work. But if I have my choice and money's not an object, I'm going here every time. Now, the problem is this is about a $170 lens. And this is upwards of a $2,000 lens. Okay. That can be in itself prohibitive to your budget or to your own financial realities, whatever. Okay. So that's why I want you to know the difference know what you can do with this, know what you can do with that. And when this doesn't measure up, if you can go out and rent this, go rent this for your films and keep this for just your photos and your personal work, okay? Because sometimes you need a professional tool to do a professional thing, okay? And that should be your biggest takeaway from this conversation is, you know, when do I, make do with my little photographic kit lens and when do i have to run down to lens pro in Oviedo and rent a cinema zoom right so hopefully that helps you a little bit and just understand that you know the reason why some of this gear is so cheap is because it was built to serve limited purposes and it's not multi-purpose and it's not you know it's not the best tool for all jobs. It's just for one job, which is snapshots. Okay. Now, yeah, that helps a lot. you know, <laughs> if you have the patience and the tolerance for all of the limitations physically of this, I mean, it's plastic, it feels cheap, but it's got Zeiss 
glass or no not like a glass lights glass inside this is some of the sharpest optical quality you can get if you can somehow endure the pain of working with this lens and exploit the quality of of the leica optics more power to you i gotta tell you right now and, and you'd be a better man than me this would make me crazy and want to shoot myself if I had to use this on a professional job because everything that I would want to do with my camera, I wouldn't be able to do because this would become my weakest link, my limitation. And it would drive me crazy because I'd say, man, if only I had my cinema zoom, I could do this and this and this and this. And then the client says, quit your complaining. You know, why can't you just take what I give you and make it good? You're supposed to be a professional. And they would, in a, in, a, in a weird way, they would be right. Because if I'm a professional, then I ought to be able to take this and get good quality out of it, despite all of its challenges and limitations. I take, I take my understanding of those limitations and then I exploit them, right? So I wouldn't shoot something that would require this if I don't have it. Shoot something that I can do with this and then exploit exactly the reasons why this is a bad choice you know like a sticky zoom you know i don't know what you could justify using a sticky zoom for but certainly um if you don't have a matte box and you're not using filters and you're getting a lot of flares because your lens is you know this tiny little thing and this small little lens and maybe you got to take your tulip hood off in order to accommodate you know something you're doing and you're getting wicked flares that could be a look and you might say yeah man i get really wild flares with this because i have to use it like this and this lens is designed to minimize flares because it's a professional zoom lens so you're not, you're going to work harder to get flares with this piece of gear than with this piece of gear so if you want flares you might choose this lens for your shots that have flares Stuff like that, you know, learn to learn to take a piece of gear, understand what it can do, understand what it can't do, and then exploit the limitations and maximize the benefits, right? That's all you can do at the end of the day. I hope that helps. Anybody, anybody else have any concerns or questions or I know this was, uh, I even felt that sometimes that I might be losing you guys with so much information. I hope I didn't, but um, is there any other uh, questions or anything I can address? Uh, all... Just a quick clarification. So the, the FC 1000 from uh, the Nicholson guys, that would be enough to, to do the upcoming assignment. That would be adequate because I know you're just talking about the differences in the lenses and all that so yeah absolutely uh and i gave you the instruction booklet for the fc 1000 and your downloadable pdfs page okay so it's there um you can read it if you if you check that lens out um go ahead and check it out and uh check in and download the instruction book and give it a quick read so you you know how to control it it's not hard. It's a, it's a pretty simple camera to learn how to use. That's why I asked him to buy those. It's it's a perfect entry level uh, little digital video camera, and it and it makes nice pictures. If I didn't believe that, I wouldn't have a. I wouldn't have asked UCF to buy thirty of them, and b. I wouldn't bought. I wouldn't have bought my own to go along with that. You know, I put my money where my mouth is. If it's good enough for the students to work with, it's good enough for me to own myself, so that you know, I can use it as a demonstration in class. I can, you know, answer questions uh, from people who are, you know, in the, in the throes of filmmaking and they, you know, reach out desperately because they need to know how to do a certain thing or find something in a menu. Uh, so I have my own version of it, but um, yeah, they're great little cameras. I like them. They don't feel like much. They, they're pretty lightweight. They're mostly plastic and everything, but again, it's got a it has, a, this one has a, um, what's this one? This is a Leica Vario Elmerit. I mean, this would be a very expensive lens if it came off and it was in a, you know, a, an aluminum cinema barrel with all the appropriate uh, controls and markings. This would be a very expensive lens, but it's been manufactured very simply and then incorporated into the body so that 
you know, if you want to grab something and run to the beach and not worry about having a whole bunch of extra parts and bits with you, it, this is all in one shot. It's all you need. So I thought this would be a good thing for you guys to shoot your assignments with. Um, and then you can work your way up because we have all those other different cameras and lenses and stuff at school for you to try out eventually and shoot with your other projects. So it's just a little entry level camera, but I, I think it's a good idea. It's a nice resource to have. Um, a lot of these cell phones are very limited in their lenses and their lens quality. So um, rather than limit yourself to that, just because it's, it's easier and you don't have to leave the house, uh, if you can justify a trip to the campus to check one of these out, you know, the, the added benefits I, I think are, you know, as I said before, many. Uh, anybody else before I let you guys go? Any other questions or concerns or anything you want to share? Yes. No. So, like I said, I have GH5. Uh, maybe you already covered this, but uh, like a cinema lens that wouldn't, you know, destroy my wallet uh, for a GH5 micro four thirds lens. What would you recommend? A zoom or any? No, just like a cinema lens. I I gotta tell you, um, well. I've got the Rokinon stuff because it came out, you know, I bought all my Rokinon stuff about uh, whew, four or five years ago by now. Um, and it was some of the first stuff that came out in a, you know, in a consumer price range. A, you know, a cinema lens, uh, you know, from any of the manufacturers, the entry price used to be, you know, around five, six thousand $6,000 and the price went up from there per lens. So having five or six lenses in a set was very cost prohibitive unless you were working all the time and you could rent those lenses back to production. Um, but when you're in film school or when you're first starting out or if it's a hobby for you or you know, if you're just puttering around and trying stuff because you don't know what you like or what you really want to invest in yet, um, the, the less expensive products were very attractive. And and the Rokinon stuff, I mean, let's face it, this 50 millimeter uh, Cinema Prime uh, only cost me 600 bucks when it first came out. It's a little bit cheaper now, um, but $600 versus $4,000. At the time, the, the Canon uh, uh, Cinema Primes came out, uh, the CM Primes, and they were about $4,000 a piece. And the reality was I had the Canon 50 millimeter lens already uh, in a photographic instrument. Uh, so, and that lens cost me $399 from Sammy's camera in LA. And they wanted, so 400 bucks, right? But in order to get the cinemized version at that time, it was gonna cost me 4,000. I was like, no, I'm not gonna give you $3,600 for basically a barrel, you know? I'll make that Canon Nifty 50 work. You know, um, or, you know, you could go and you could pick up a set of Rokinons and you could have a six lens set for two, twenty five, three thousand dollars $3,000, right? Um, you know, and it made a lot of sense. So I went with these and then, you know, as time goes by and, and manufacturing gets better and uh, more people start getting on the bandwagon, you know, we have this wonderful company out there now called Meka, and they're making cinema lenses and, and micro four thirds. So all of my Rokinon stuff is in Canon EF, which is designed to cover a sensor as large as 24 by 36 millimeters. But a lens that's designed that only needs to cover micro four thirds, A, doesn't need to be quite as big. B, it's gonna have the micro four thirds mount on it. So I don't have to adapt anything at all and I can take this lens as it is, and I can put it right on the GH5, and I can go to work, okay? And this one is a, what is this? This is a 12 millimeter, which on a GH5 is a 24 millimeter lens, okay? And it has a wide angle to it. It's a very nice image. It's sharp as hell. 
this lens is very sharp. So it's a very good quality image that comes out of it. It's small and compact. It complements the size of the GH5 very nicely. And I think I paid $330 for it, right? So, you know, it's within reach now, the cost of this equipment where it used to be very cost prohibitive 10 years ago. Um, and that's a benefit of, you know, the new millennium and, you know, the era in which we live. And quite frankly, in all honesty, um, it, it's also part of the, you know, the Chinese uh, manufacturing base, which has been growing by leaps and bounds over the last decade. Part of their incentive for getting involved on the world stage in global markets was to produce products that were a fraction of the cost of being produced anywhere else. If you buy a cinema lens made in Germany, you're going to pay about as much for that lens as you possibly can. It's going to cost you anywhere from seven to fifteen thousand dollars a piece. You buy them made in England, the same thing, four to eight thousand dollars a piece. Um, you know, you buy a, there's very few cinema lenses made in the United States anymore. Um, most of those companies have gone out of business a long time ago. So you're looking at Japanese cinema lenses. Um, and then you're looking at the stuff made, the Rokinons are made in uh, North Korea. That's about as close to an American product or South Korea, North Korea, <laughs> South Korea. Um, and the South Korean manufacturing base is totally the result of, of U.S. intervention in South Korea. So this is about as close to an American cinema lens as you can get at this point, the Rokinon product, because it's made in a U.S. Uh, allied country in their manufacturing base. Um, the DZO stuff, this cinema zoom, as pricey as it is, was made in China. If this cinema zoom was made in Japan, it would be easily twice what I paid for it. And so there are lenses like, um, um, not Lomo, but um, La Laua, Loa. Loa, I believe, is made in, in Japan. And the, the equivalent lens from Loa is over $4,000, 4,600 bucks. Okay. So buy in at the level you can afford or rent at the level you can afford. Um, and, you know, understand that that's part of the cost of your cre your choice for creative expression you know if you want to paint brushes and paints cost something if you want to shoot photos cameras cost something video is even more expensive um pass those costs on to your clients when you become a professional you know rent your gear um do stuff like that um but Embrace the economics as a part of life because it's it's going to be if this is going to be your career. Okay. And then save money wherever you can. Buy used lenses, but look for a used lens on eBay or Amazon or KEH camera brokers in Atlanta is a big client of mine that I've had. I've been buying lenses from them for over 30 years. And save money that way. Um but renting is a really good choice for you guys right now. And you got one right down the road in Oviedo, four miles from campus. And they'll rent to students all day long. Okay. <laughs> Miranda, you look like you're ready, to, you're ready to go crazy or something. You wanna get out of here. <laughs> Anybody else? Anything at all before we... Uh, Adjourn to lunch. No, it was just crazy. In the middle of this meeting, um, our fire alarm started going off, and I had to turn off my camera and run out of the building because I wasn't sure if it was <laughs> if, if it was an actual fire. And then it turned out to be, you know, just a drill. But we came back here, and this was still blaring for like another twenty minutes. So I'm here, like trying to hear you, but also this thing is hurting my ears. So I'm here trying to hear half what you're saying. <laughs> Well, the good news is I recorded the session so you can check it out later. Find out what you missed. <laughs> yeah, I got a phone call in the middle of the whole thing and I had somebody asking me questions on the phone. I could hear them before I cut it out. <laughs> All right, well, shall we adjourn then? Um, do I have a first on the motion to adjourn? A second.
Excellent. Mm. All right, then. Uh, if there's anything else I haven't covered and you have questions or whatever, feel free to reach out to me on email. Check out the modules because the modules has more information that might make better sense than I made today with my gibberish. Um, but uh, reach out if you need help. Otherwise, uh, let's get ready for next week. Uh, we're going to do 1.7 and 1.8. And I think uh, I think your quiz will be also due at the end of next week. So your midterm quiz. So start with that. Oh, I put all the decks so far on web courses. Look in the, I created a new section called resources. Okay. And I pulled out your bookshelf, your glossaries. Here's all your decks. Oops. I'm not sharing anymore. Hold on. I'm not sharing anymore. Share. There we go. Uh, so here it is down here. See that all decks. And if you open that up, it's got everything including 1.6 from today. Okay. So each one of these is PDF forms of the keynote presentation. All right. They look a little bit different in PDF form than they do when it's presented in Keynote on the computer. This background is actually black and the PDFs, the background is white. So it ends up being kind of gr a grayish kind of slide, but you can still read the text and you can see the photos just fine and everything like that, okay? So here's all of your, somebody asked for me for that on Monday, here they are. And each week as we finish a, a set, I'll put it up on here, okay? All right, so that's that. So let's adjourn then. And uh, I'll see you all again really, really soon. All righty, have a good afternoon, have a good weekend, and I'll see you all again on Monday. Bye, thank you, you too. Thanks, <clears throat> have a good day.